All right, good evening. My name is Becky Thompson. I'm the director of the Kentucky Beef Network, and I want to welcome you to session one, Key Profit Drivers and Controlling Hay Costs of the Managing Cow-Calf Opera Operations Profit Conference. While we are disappointed that we're not together in person, we do have a great set of uh, speakers this evening and that has some great information for you. Tonight's program comes to you through funding by the Kentucky Agriculture Development Fund through a partnership with the Kentucky Beef Network and the University of Kentucky Department of Agriculture Economics. We will be recording tonight's presentations and sharing the video links later on. Before we get started, I want to touch on a few Zoom housekeeping tips. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat box and you can submit your comments at any time at the chat box by simply clicking chat, typing your comment and submitting it to everyone. You can also use the question and answer window, which allows you to, answer, allows you to ask questions to our panelists that we will uh, facilitate through at the conclusion of their presentations. At this time, I would like to turn over our program to Kenny, Greg, and Jonathan to start the evening for us. Thanks, Becky. I guess we're ready to go. And I know so myself, Greg, and Jonathan are all three going to talk here in this opening, opening piece of the program. But I know I speak for all three of us when I say how glad we are everybody's on. Definitely want to thank Becky for all her work on the webinar and helping us with the moderation. Nikki's on from KCA as well. Thanks to Nikki. I also want to thank our department communications person, Nicole Atherton, who has helped a lot with helped a lot with the promotion and some of the flyers and QR code survey, things like that. So thanks to thanks to all of you. I appreciate that very much. Um, so a little background on this. So Greg and Jonathan and I really started having conversations back in 2018 about a desire that we had for an intensive full day program aimed at profit driven cow calf operations. And we started that conversation, like I say, back, I think, in the fall of 2018. And we were fortunate enough later in 2018 to get some support for the initial programs that we did in 2020 through from the Development Board of the Beef Network, provided funding for travel, some of Jonathan's time, some of the uh, some of the materials that we were able to put together. And that's how this began. And we did a series of these beginning in, I guess, December, early 2019, going through um, about the end of January 2020. And we had five of those done in the first. So by the end of January, we had done five of these in different places across the state. We had five more scheduled for UK spring break in the middle of March and then COVID hit. So that really kind of took away our momentum and we had to go get back on the road and do these. So that was disappointing. I know all three of us. So this is our attempt to offer these in kind of a virtual format. I'm gonna provide some quick market perspective to begin with. This is not a market outlook program at all. It's geared, it's, it's more a management type program, but I wanna give some market perspective and talk about some things, kind of why we frame this the way that we have. So what I'm showing you right now is the nearby feeder cattle futures contract. Across the X axis there is dates and I'm running this from January of 2008, basically to February of 2021. The y-axis is dollars per hundred weight. And what I'm showing you is the nearby feeder cattle futures contract. I like to describe it this way. If the feeder cattle market had a pulse, this is that pulse. And this is what heavy feeder cattle, 800 pound feeder steers, medium and large rammer ones and twos are worth out in the western part of the country, center part of the US. Now, the first, the first point there that I've, I've noted with the dotted red line, this is 2008 to 2010. I want you to notice that that nearby feeder cattle futures contract traded right around a dollar a pound or hundred bucks a hundred weight. Now we took that to a new level between 2010 and 2012. And I want to remind you what that time period was like. Now we had severe drought in Kentucky in 2012. We had three really dry years in the Southern Plains. So we lost a lot of cows in Texas and Oklahoma, for example. I think that's part of what set us up what we saw later, but we kind of reached a new plateau there in 12, 13, and 14. We know the rest of the story too, that what we saw in 2014 and 15 was frankly the, was frankly the strongest cattle market we'd ever seen. And that was about an 18 to 24 month period where we saw prices like we had never seen before. We also all remember though how quickly things changed from about the second half of 2015 to about the start of 2017. And we had very quickly moved back to where we were in 2013. 
And if you kind of look at the more recent time period, post that 2014 time period, we've really gone back to a level that we would say looks a whole lot like what we saw price-wise before those 2014 and 15 runs that we saw. So in terms of perspective, I think the first thing that we would say is the cattle markets that we've seen the last few years, and now granted COVID was obviously an anomaly last year, but the cattle markets of the last five years really have looked a lot like what we saw pre-2014 and 15. I'm going to quickly show you some prices. And, and of course, you know, the, the new market report came out from case from KDA this afternoon. So this is actually week before last. We're going to show you basic prices here for what was what was a week ago now. So the week of March 6th through March 12th. We're going to show you the three kind of three common calf weights. We're going to show you from 450 to 600 pounds in 50 pound increments. Current week, look at where prices are. We've kind of been in this 148 to 159 range on those midpoint ranges, state average. Unusual, this was this is very uncommon, but the first week of March, prices were actually higher than they were the second week of March. So that's not usually the case. And you can compare this to last year, and this was almost something that caught me off guard, but it's interesting that we see very little difference between the price this week in 2021 and what we saw the same week in 2020. This second week of March in 2020 just happened to be the week right before COVID started impact markets. So it was the very week after this, that, essentially the week that we had last week a year ago, where we really started to see the market impacts from COVID. So kind of finishing up our setup, you know, one of the questions I get asked a lot as an economist is when are we going to see the kind of markets that we saw for calves that we saw in 2014 and 15? And, you know, the truth of the matter is that was a very unusual set of circumstances that brought us those calf prices that we had that year. And we described those as there. They were a gift. They were an opportunity for us to get some things done, to pay off some debt, to, you know, to make some further operation. You know, we're not we're not planning for that anytime soon. We are in what probably is going to be what is, I guess, the th well, should be the third year of herd liquidation. And we are seeing this cow herd decrease in size. It did in 2019, did in 2020. I think it will again in 2021. It's not a great calf market. Um, you know, our, our steer heifer average last year um, in the fall was somewhere probably in the low, low 120s. So not a good calf market by any means. But also, it's actually closer to normal than probably what we saw back in 2014 and 15. So, a lot of reasons to think that we're going to see calf prices improve over the next, you know, certainly the rest of this year, but probably the next year or two due to, due to cow numbers decreasing and also due to the fact that we're going to see, I think, some improvement in, 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 in export markets and here on the demand side. But, you know, one of the major focuses of this conference really is going to come down to what are some things that we can hopefully equip you with to help you be profitable in a $1.50 calf market? And I think that really is a key. Again, we're not, you know, we're not forecasting, you know, calves in the 2 250 range anytime soon. So we hope that when that happens again, that that is a major windfall for you if it happens again and you see incredible profits. But we think to be profitable long run, you've got to be profitable in what we describe as a more normal calf market, which is one, frankly, that probably has calf prices a lot closer to $1.50. And that's kind of the purpose of this conference. And then Jonathan and Greg now, now have some things to share with you. So as I take control of the screen here, I just want to talk to you about, you know, how do we, um, you know, increase profit? And in general, there's two broad ways that we can do that, right? We can either do that through increasing revenues, or we can approach that from the decreasing cost side of things as well. And the, you know, optimal solution, we could do a bit of both. Um, but let's talk through some of the increasing revenue side of things and, and kind of think through that a little bit. And then we'll spend some time talking about uh, decreasing cost uh, as well. So revenue side, one thing we could do is produce larger calves, right? Um, maybe do some creep feeding uh, to get those uh, uh, calf sizes up a little bit better. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Uh, Kenny will will talk through some of that uh, perspective on um, evening two. Um, so now that I've mentioned that, let me just take a, a moment just to remind everybody that whenever you registered for this conference, uh, you have to actually register for all three days. So if you've just registered for today, 
I encourage you to, you know, make sure you go back and register for, for tomorrow and, and Thursday as well. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, we can produce more calves, um, right? Um, uh, what I forgot to tell you is when I started plugging our program for the next two nights is, you know, there are costs associated with, uh, you know, creep feeding. And, and like I said, Kenny will, will cover that in more detail. Uh, we could produce more calves, uh, you know, have a higher stocking rate uh, is one way we could do that uh, on the revenue side. But once again, that's uh, not going to come without uh, cost as well. And so Greg will talk to us about that a little bit on uh, evening three. Uh, and then, you know, uh, the last or the third way we could increase revenue, right, is having a, a higher weaning weight uh, or, excuse me, a higher weaning percentage. And, um, you know, that's kind of our, our free lunch here, so to speak. That's one thing that uh, management, uh, small tweaks in management uh, could, could help us achieve uh, that may uh, not cost as much as, as those previous two things. And uh, Kenny will get into that a little bit uh, more for us too um, tomorrow evening. So really what I wanna do, uh, if we think about this increasing revenue problem is focus on the decreasing cost side of things and want to talk through, you know, what are some areas that we can focus on in order to achieve that. So what we've got here, um, just, you know, the, the costs associated uh, with um, a cow-calf uh, operation on a per cow basis. And what we want to look at here is starting off with, is with cow depreciation interest, you know, we want to be in that 110 to $130 range, um, you know, per cow. And so the medium level we're going to use here is going to be 125 on the low end, 100, the high end, 175. The big thing I want you to focus in on here, though, is this range. And just note that there's, you know, uh, a potential for, for there to be a lot of difference in cost uh, for cow depreciation and interest uh, between operations. Now, this is one area where um, you know, if you bought, um, you know, high priced cows or I'm sorry, high priced heifers, uh, you, you might be kind of stuck with that, but um, we'll talk through that some more and Kenny will we'll get into that some more uh, on evening uh, two as well. Uh, but let me go ahead and lay out the rest of these costs for us here. So on the hay side, we're looking at a mid range cost of about $175 per cow, low end 50, high end 300. Uh, uh, the difference, of course, between the high and the low gives us the range there at 250. Uh, we've got pasture uh, fencing, uh, a range of 70 there, high, on, high of 80, low of 10. Uh, on and on here with pasture fertilization and clipping, another $70 range between the, the estimates for a high versus low cost operator. The breeding side, um, mid range is 50. Uh, so, um, 25 to 75 is, is kind of the bookends there between the low and the high. Vet medicine, uh, mineral, uh, so on and so forth. I think everybody kind of gets the idea here of what we're doing. We're, we're just laying out these kind of low cost versus high cost and, and then what the midpoint may be. Um, what I really want you to focus in on though is this range. Uh, think about, um, you know, which of these costs do we have the most control over? Uh, while also thinking about which costs uh, have the highest range. Um, so without a doubt, hay falls right in there uh, as something that we have uh, control over. And it also has the, the highest range between, you know, a low cost versus a high cost type operation. Um, I've already kind of talked to you a little bit about the cow depreciation and interest uh, concerns there. Like I said, you've got control over this, but we're also not overlooking the fact that bread heifers, uh, if you were buying back in the 2014, 2015 time period, you might've bought some that were, you know, $2,500. So you may be kind of stuck with that uh, in, in the short term, but in the long term, you do have uh, control over what you're paying for uh, animals if, you, if you're buying. And, and like I said, Kenny will, will walk us through some considerations uh, on that uh, for us to think through. Other depreciation interest, this is going to catch um, things that you don't really see listed here. So this is going to be, you know, other machinery that's not related to, to hay production, um, you know, the ATVs, the trucks, those kind of things. 
And that's going to vary, you know, quite a bit uh, between operations. But also tied, as if we're just looking at the ranges here, tied with that $70 range is, is pasture fencing as well. Um, so this is an area where, you know, you may actually not want to fall on this low end. Uh, you may not want to strive to be the low cost producer here. Um, why? Uh, it could be because you don't have, uh, you know, it, it could be indicative of not having enough uh, pasture per cow. Um, you also probably don't want to be on the high end of that either. Um, you know, maybe you're overcapitalized uh, on fencing. Same thing, uh, or the same kind of logic kind of follows here for the pasture fertilization and clipping. You probably don't want to be, you know, on the high end uh, range of this because then you're probably uh, spending a whole lot on uh, fertilizer. Um, arguably on the, the low end side, you, you probably don't have as good of pastures uh, or not spending enough on fertilizer. And so with both of those, both the pasture fertilization and, and clipping and the pasture fencing, if you did fall here in this lower bound of these estimates, you know, it's, you're kind of lying to yourself because you're probably going to have much higher hay cost uh, as a result. Because once again, you're not going to have enough pasture per cow uh, or not have adequate pasture and you're going to have to uh, feed a whole lot uh, more hay. Uh, these three here, uh, breeding, vet, medicine, mineral, um, once again, these are, are costs that you probably don't want to fall on the low end. You want to try to hit this, this middle section. Um, you know, for example, with mineral, if you're cutting a lot of your mineral with salt, you know, you may be um, bringing on some health issues. So striving to be the, the lowest possible here is probably not uh, the best case scenario. Um, but also being on the high end is, is not going to be beneficial either. Um, think about breeding, for example, uh, if you're up here on the higher spectrum or the higher end of the, the of that range, um, you know, maybe you've got too many bulls uh, for the number of cows that you've got. Maybe you're just uh, spending too much on genetics in general. By the same token, if you're down here on the low end, maybe you're trying to cover too many cows with too few bulls. So, um, you know, there's clearly things in here that we want to um, look at and think of, but don't want to leave you with the impression that you want to always strive to be down here on the low end, that there are, you know, um, while we want to be low cost producers, there are some trade-offs there that, that may not be beneficial. So once again, just focus uh, here on this range. Think about what you have the most control over and which one has the highest range in it. And undoubtedly, that's hay. And that's the one that we uh, absolutely have a lot of control over. And that's one of the things that we hope with this conference that we can show you um, is, you know, maybe some ways to address um, what your hay costs are uh, per cow and, and ways to, to lower those costs. And now Greg will talk to us. You're muted, Greg. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that. Um, I'm going to finish up the intro here. And what I'm going to essentially summarize is, is an um, article that the three of us wrote um, in February. And basically, we were looking at cow-calf profitability estimates for last year, 2020, um, and then essentially trying to project the same thing for this upcoming uh, year's calf crop. So I think this will help just kind of give a baseline to the rest of the conference in terms of where the kind of average costs are, where, where likely returns are, that sort of thing. All right, so let's start off with um, our estimate for, our, for the revenue side. So we've got a 550 pound steer heifer average. Um, and again, this is for last year, 2020. And so we're, we're using a price of $1.30 average across that steer heifer, uh, gives us $715 in total revenue. Now, one thing that we sometimes forget about is that we're not gonna wean 100% of the, the calves from, from our cows. So we need to essentially count for open cows and, and essentially calves that, that died after they were born. So we typically think of about a 15% um, combination for those two as, as kind of being probably about average. Obviously a lot of farms are gonna do a lot better than that, but there are a lot of farms that, that do a lot worse than that. 
So using kind of the average, that, that essentially forces us to, to subtract off $107, and that brings our, our essentially gross revenue at about $608 per cow. Now we're going to look at our costs. And one thing we started doing differently last year, and so this year was the second time we essentially used this approach, but this is one of those things where if you can't beat them, join them. And, and, so, and we realize a lot of farms think more in terms of their cash costs and don't initially think about things like depreciation, their labor, uh, land costs, you know, being cognizant that we need to count that at some point, but just from the standpoint that initially they may not look at that, we decided to take that same approach. So we're going to try to subtract off just kind of typical cash costs uh, from that gross revenue. So think of that as we go through here. These are kind of just cash type costs. So the first one's pasture maintenance. Um, so that would be kind of clipping, uh, fertilizer, a uh, little bit of say seeding right now, a lot of folks are, are putting down clover in their pasture. So those sort of things um, would not include, uh, again, depreciation on fencing, anything like that. that. We'll talk about that kind of at the very end. So just the cash costs related to that. So we've got two acres per cow, $20 per acre. I would say that's fairly you know, bare bones in terms of expenses. So we've got a total of $40 per cow um, with that. Hay costs, um, I've got, or we've got two and a half tons per cow there. Obviously that's gonna vary tremendously. We'll discuss this on the third evening in, in terms of maybe where you need to be in, in, in terms of to be most profitable, but let's start with two and a half tons. Um, we've got a cash cost. We're assuming here you're, you're producing your own hay, uh, not buying it, but producing it. So cash cost for producing that hay of, of about $35 a ton. That gives us about $88 total cash cost for a hay expense. Uh, other costs, kind of Jonathan already went through some of these. Um, and, and so these are kind of those mid ranges. So mineral 35, that 25, breeding 40, marketing, that'd be, you know, when you sell at stockyards. Uh, winter feeding and other machinery. So think about everything other than clipping pastures and making hay that would fall kind of under that category for your machinery, $15 a cow there. Trucking, that would be not just the calves, but you know, running the town, get supplies, that sort of thing, another $15 a cow there. Kenny is gonna go in, into detail in, in terms of cow depreciation interest on the third evening, uh, but somewhere in that range is, is pretty close to where probably most folks are right now. Then of course, all these additional expenses that may only be two or $3 each, maybe some cases up to 20, but they, they all add up quick. And so we've got about $40 of those other costs there. And if we add them all up, we're at $440 per cow. Again, this is more kind of from the cash standpoint, we're gonna talk about the other costs here in a minute. So our, our adjusted revenue that we've already seen is $608. Those cash costs that came up with were 440. So if we subtract the difference, we get what I'm calling a gross return of $168. Now that looks good initially, right? That's a big positive number and that's good. Um, but remember, we're not accounting for all costs here. We're not accounting for depreciation interest on uh, equipment or even facilities like your barn handling facilities, fencing, all those things. We're also not including or not accounting for land or return on your labor. So in fairness, um, you know, so backing up. So again, we have, we have what looks like a very good positive return, um, but we need to adjust for these and, and we'll look at a, a couple examples in terms of doing that. So this is an example, you know, it's not going to fit any farm perfectly. Some farms are going to be higher and some costs lower than others. Um, so yeah, we understand that and, and you can kind of adjust this on your own, but we're doing this more as an example. Just And, and by the way, we're, we're keeping the costs about as low as maybe not the absolute bare bones, but we're definitely well below what we would say the, the medium cost would be for each of these categories. So keep that in mind. So equipment depreciation, equipment interest, fencing and, and other facilities, so your, your barns, handling facilities, that sort of thing, the depreciation on those and the interest on those facilities. Then land rent, what we're using here is, is roughly about two acres of pasture, just under one, one acre of, of hay ground and at about $33 an acre, that brings that land rent to $100 a cow. So understand that to me would be bare bones because I, I, I want something better than $33 return on, on for every acre of land that I have in production personally. 
labor. Um, Kenny came up with this number about $100 per cow. That obviously will, will depend. Bigger operations probably have a lower number per cow. Smaller operations probably have a higher number per cow. And if we add all those up together, we come up with about $350 per cow. Now, what I'm going to do just to simplify this, all that depreciation interest, the four categories, I'm just going to combine into one just to kind of simplify that. So same still comes up at $350 per cow, but just to simplify. And so now we can kind of look at those, those three different costs. Again, we've got our adjusted revenue up there, $608, the cash costs. Then we look at the depreciation interest, the land rent, and then the labor. And when we subtract all those out, all of a sudden, we, what was a very good positive number now looks like a very bad <laughs> negative number. Um, so essentially, it looks like we're losing about $180. Uh, so not good. So yeah, I, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, those aren't really all cash costs. And they aren't. If, if your land is paid for, that's not a, a cash cost, right? But it's it's kind of foregone rent that you could have had if you, if say, you're renting to your neighbor, right? Um, same with your labor. If, if, if all that is either yours or family labor, it's not a cash cost, right? But it's, it's still an expense to some degree for you. And hopefully we want you to get some kind of return there. So <clears throat> what if we just look at depreciation interest? So backing up, yeah, land, and again, if it's paid for labor really isn't a cash cost, but surely depreciation interest is, it may not be in the short run, right? If, if you paid it, if you paid for it initially, you may not have to write that check every year, but long run, you've got to retain enough profits to essentially pay for that, that worn out tractor or uh, worn out fence at the end of 30 years, say for the fence. So that in the long run is, is a cash cost. So if, if we at least subtract that out, uh, we'll get what we call a, a return to land and labor. And so in this case, that's $18 per cow. So there are different ways we can look at this and I'll just, Give you one example. So one way we could look at this is essentially uh, we're getting absolutely no return on our land and, and we're essentially paying for about 20% of our hours that we work. So to me that doesn't sound very profitable. I, I, you know, we, we want to do better than that. So but again just for context that's essentially what that or one interpretation of what that would mean. Now that's with prices from 2020 so $1.30 steer heifer average and hopefully this year, especially where the, the feeder cattle futures are for this fall, we hope that will be a lot higher for this fall. So what if price go up to $1.50? And again, that's kind of our long run expectations or, or hope of, of where those prices will be long run. So what if, what if we bump that um, price up to $1.50? So obviously going to increase that adjusted revenue. We keep those other costs the same. So now we have a return to land and labor of about $112. So again, I'll just give you one interpretation of, of what that may mean for someone. So in this case, I may be fully compensating myself for my labor, um, but I'm, I'm only getting about one in 10 acres that I own um, compensation for the land. In other words, 10% of, of your land is being compensated. The rest essentially um, is not. So still doesn't sound very profitable to me, but it's improving. Uh, so the focus of this conference, kind of like Kenny said, was if we can figure out a way to make a profit at a dollar fifty kind of long run average, that would be great, and that's that's our goal. So let's look at this from that standpoint. So let's go through the costs again. Uh, Seven hundred two dollars for that. Just I'm sorry, that would be the revenue, not cost. The four hundred forty on the cash costs, and, and one hundred fifty on the depreciation interest. So that's pre conference. That's kind of our expectations pre conference, and that's where we get that one hundred twelve dollar. Uh, return to land and labor. What if, and this is post-conference, what if we can we can change that adjusted revenue? So Kenny is going to go over a number of things tomorrow evening that hopefully can, can help you figure out how can I increase that revenue without really increasing any of the costs or, or increasing the costs very slowly and increasing the revenue side quite a bit higher. Um, if we can just bump that up, say $23, $725 per cow, now our net return jumps up to 135. So we're, we're doing a little bit better. We're getting a little bit more compensation on that land. What if on the cash cost side, what if we, we can shave off, let's say $40? And we're gonna cover a number of ways all three nights. So the rest of this evening, we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, tomorrow and, and Thursday evening. So if we can shave off $40 there, 
what does that do to that, that net return bumps it up to $175. So we're pretty close to covering all our, our labor and land at this point, but not quite. What about depreciation interest? So that's at $150 right now. What if we can drop that by about $25? And, and we'll talk about a way later on this evening how to do that. Um, and if we're able to do that, we've got that net return bumped up to $200. So in that case, we fully compensated ourselves for labor and a return, at least a, a minimal return on that land investment. So that's good. It's still not technically profitable, but it, essentially it's a whole lot better than what we're looking at. And, and maybe, just maybe, we're wrong on that long-term price forecast. So what if instead of $1.50, it turns out to be more like $1.60? That's going to bump up the revenue side. And folks, we're making a profit here. We're making about $50 true profit on this cow-calf operation if that price was that, turned out to be that long-term true price expectation. So kind of in summary, we're trying to get you to make a profit or at least break even at $1.50. And again, if we're wrong, and we hope we're wrong, that price will be a little bit higher than that $1.50 long run, uh, put yourself in a position where you can actually make a true profit. Now, one last kind of background piece of information. So you will see hopefully a lot of practical information the next three nights. Um, and, and maybe one note or worthy thing to, to mention here is, is that this isn't gonna be theory to us. Almost everything that you're gonna see in the next three nights are, are gonna be actually tried on, on our individual farms. So Kenny and I farm together in Southern Woodford County, Jonathan farms in Franklin County, and essentially just about everything you're going to see is something that we've tried on our farms in, in some cases up to 10 years before essentially um, we try pushing it on others. So hopefully it's practical. Hopefully you'll pick up a number of things. In some cases, you're going to see a few maybe radical ideas. Uh, but again, just realize it's, it's not from the ivory tower. It's something actually that we tried um, on our individual farms. That said, uh, do we want to take questions right now at, at the end of the intro, or do we want to wait to the very end, Becky? Right now, we have two questions in the Q&A box that I think it would be a great time to take. All right. So the first one is, uh, what about the discount that is seen in the market when calves get too fat? My market discounts any calf fatter than a good background condition score. This sounds like a good question for Kenny. Yeah, I was going to say, let me answer this one. So I think the point that uh, that Ira was making, actually, I, I think the comment came as Jonathan was talking about um, creep feeding. And I like the point she's making or he's making is that you've got to make certain that, you know, we, anytime you're feeding calves, whether it be full feed or creep feed, you want to watch body condition. And, you know, I always watch those market reports and I always look for the descriptors on the, on the end, and when you see the word fleshy next to cattle, there's a price discount there. So I think the point being made is, you know, adding pounds is important and it's good, but also make sure that you watch body condition so you don't get those fleshy, fleshy discounts. And then the next question is, how does depreciation count against someone? Jonathan, you want to take this question? Yeah. So. The, the, the concept of, of depreciation, I hope I'm understanding the question correctly. You know, the, the concept of depreciation is that you're purchasing something that has a useful life, uh, you know, greater than a year. So you certainly wouldn't, uh, you know, deduct the entire cost of, of a cow that you purchased in one year because she's going to be productive over a period of years. But you, you did actually spend money on her. Um, and so you do have to count the cost of her over her life. Um, so... Um, that, that's how it counts against you, just because you may not be writing a, a check to the depreciation uh, department because that doesn't exist. It's not a cash cost, but there is an actual cost associated with, with owning those capital assets uh, over the life of those assets. That's all the questions we have right now. So I think we can move into the next presentation. Again, I'll remind everyone, as you have questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A box to, answer the, to ask them, and we will uh, address them at the end of the presentation. And we'll be up in just a second here. I've, I've got to load the next. All right. Okay. 
All right, so we are into the, the kind of the meat of the conference now. So this is where we're going to actually hopefully give you some practical ideas of, of things that you can do to improve profitability. Uh, so the first one is we're going to look at it essentially overhead costs and hay production. Um, what we're going to cover here is essentially is applicable to anything that you have depreciation on. So your, you know, your, your facilities, barns, handling facilities, that sort of thing. Uh, we're not going to have time to cover all that. So what I, what we decided is it would probably be more instructive to focus on the, the biggest of those costs or the one cost that tends to get out of hand quickest. But just realize what we're covering here kind of applies to all these other ones as well. We're just focusing on, on one particular one. So Jonathan already went over this table. This again, he was giving kind of the range in, in costs from low to high and, and the, the range between those for all these. And again, what was that biggest cost by far? Wasn't anything even close between that the low and the high. It was that hay cost, right? So we're gonna actually talk a lot about hay costs over the next um, three evenings. And the focus is gonna be the rest, rest of tonight. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, on, um, on the third evening also. So just as we, as we did that kind of same thing for a cow-calf operation in terms of looking at all the costs and seeing which one kind of we have the most control over, let's now do that same thing for hay costs in specifically just for hay costs. So same type of thing, I'm gonna show you the, the various costs of hay production on the left, all the main ones, I'm not gonna show every little one like bale or twine, but, but the main categories. And then the right-hand side, I'm gonna show you the cost per ton. So first one is fuel. And, and so the, the range there for the cost per ton, by the way, the, and, and Jonathan did the same thing. There are gonna be some farms out there that are a little bit below the low or some farms that are above the high. We kind of threw out the extremes and, and we tried to get kind of, you know, the middle 70 to 80% or so. So for fuel, I've got that at six to $8 per ton. Just for refer reference, I know a lot of people aren't used to thinking in tons. Um, so I like to think two five by five bales can be roughly a ton or each one's about a thousand pounds. So if you're thinking more in, in terms of bales, you would roughly divide that by two. Repairs, maintenance, four to $10 per ton. Labor, six to 10. Land, five to 15. Fertilizer, five to 25. And then depreciation interest, 10 to $50 per ton. So out of all those main categories, which one by far has the most variance? And, and then also on the high side has by far the highest cost. And it's that bottom one, right? Depreciation interest. And we also call that overhead. We call that fixed cost. So, you know, both those terms, if we say fixed costs or overhead costs, we're referring to that depreciation interest combination. Um, so to help us understand the dynamics of this, we're actually going to look at three different examples, kind of three different capital outlays for hay equipment. So the first one, 60,000, then the middle one will be 40, and the third one will be 20. Um, and I will lay out a, you know, specific examples of the tractors, equipment, other equipment, et cetera. Don't be so concerned about every piece of equipment. Just think about overall, is, is this scenario closer to what I have or is scenario two or scenario three? So it doesn't have to fit exactly. Just think about in aggregate, which, which one may be closest. Um, so we've got three tractors on this farm. Um, when I do these presentations live, I, you know, people tell me, you know, why they're doing certain things. And so the reason I always hear that we need three tractors is what? It's so we never, while we're making hay, we never have to unhook an implement, right? We've got one tractor hooked up to the, the mower, one to the rake, one to the baler. Um, and we've, we've got that equipment down below and we've got some miscellaneous equipment. Now for the tractors, at least, we're gonna use those for things other than just making hay, right? We're gonna clip pastures with them. We're gonna feed hay in the winter time, which is different than making hay. That would be, and all these other things that we use tractors for would go into what we call the, the cattle enterprise, not the hay making enterprise. And, and the reason we're making that distinction is essentially so we can allocate that part of those tractors costs that fit into each of those enterprise. So for tractor one, um, we've got $35,000. And, and by the way, in, in this example, some of this equipment may, may be new. Some probably a lot of it's gonna be used even here in examples two and three, probably all that equipment's gonna be used. Uh, just, just as kind of a heads up on that. So in this case, uh, what we're gonna do is multiply that 35,000 by, by 40% or 0.4, and that will give us our hay capital. So in this case, $14,000. Do the same thing for tractor two. Um, 
and that gives us just a little over seven thousand dollars. Tractor three, that's just a little, little under four thousand. Now, for all the other equipment, it, all we use it for are, is in that hay operation. So it's one hundred percent. We just drop all this cost uh, into that category, and we add them all, and that's where we come up with that sixty thousand. Now, if you are just in case you're interested, if we add up the rest of the value on the tractors that are in the cattle enterprise, uh, that we come up with just about $100,000, 97,500. All right, so we are gonna break, get very specific in terms of depreciation. There, there are really two types of depreciation and to help you understand difference or the distinction, I'm gonna use an example. So think about buying two new tractors. Doesn't really matter, let's just say the $50,000 piece, same, same tractor. Um, and one of them gets delivered to you and you immediately park it in the equipment shed and, and don't use it for an entire year. The other tractor comes in um, and you use that one quite a bit. I don't know what you do on a cattle farm to put 500 hours on it in one year, but let's say you did. And at the end of that one year, you go to sell both tractors and you start with the one that you stored in the equipment shed. Now you paid 50,000 for it, but are you gonna get 50,000 selling it one year later? And the answer is no, right? You're not going to. And that's what we call that fixed component of depreciation. Doesn't matter if you use it or not, every year it's gonna drop in value. And that's, that's what I have there. Now, then we go to sell that second tractor, the one that we used quite intensively for, for that one year. And the question is, are we gonna get as much for that one as one that we parked in the, in the equipment shed and didn't use at all? And the answer of course there is, is also no, we're, we're not. And that's the variable component of depreciation. The more that we use it, the more it's gonna drop in value. But by the way, when I say depreciation here, I mean real depreciation, not IRS or, or tax depreciation. So in other words, what it actually drops in value if you, if you want to sell it, uh, that's what we're talking about when we say depreciation. Then of course, interest rate, um, and I'm only using 3% here, obviously for a lot of folks, if, if you've got a commercial loan, it's gonna be higher than that. Um, so just keep that in mind. It, it can be higher than what I'm showing here. And the same for the, the base depreciation, probably in a lot of cases that may be a little bit higher uh, than what I'm showing. So think of this as um, if it looks bad in your, your particular example, what I'm showing here, it may actually look a little bit worse. Um, we're gonna look at the same diagram three different times, one for each of the examples. So I'll go through it kind of in detail the first time just to make sure you understand it. So on the bottom there, that's how, how much tons of hay that we produce on an average year. So all the way up to 500 tons. So again, just for reference, 500 tons would be about a thousand five by five bales. On the left-hand side, that's how much depreciation interest that we have um, divided by the total tons of hay that we produce on the average year. So in other words, total depreciation interest on a per ton basis. And I'll, I'll show you a few examples just so you understand exactly what that really means. So let's start with this example. Let's say that you, on average, you make about 100 tons of hay with that equipment on your farm. So again, just for reference, that would be roughly 200 five by five bales. So what you do is you draw a line from 100 to that diagram, that, that curve. And then when you hit it, draw a straight line over to the left, just like you see there, read that number. It looks like roughly $27, $28. And that would be essentially how much depreciation on a per ton, every ton of hay that you produce, how much depreciation interest that you have in that. Um, just for reference, if, if hay kind of is sells in your area for say $70 a ton, uh, you're not quite halfway there, but you're getting close in terms of depreciation interest is almost half the value of that hay. So in other words, even if we're doing everything else right on the hay operation, we're, we're probably not going to make, a, well, I can pretty much tell you, you're not going to be profitable on your hay operation with, with a cost that high. And we'll talk about what level you need to get it down to here in a minute. But what I want you to see here is how quickly that can change. So what if instead of making 100 tons of hay, we're just making 50 tons of hay. So about 105 by five bales. Do the same thing, draw that line over, and we're just above $50 um, of depreciation interest per ton that we produce. So again, if that hay in your area sells for $70 a ton, we're almost at the full value of the hay just in depreciation interest. We've not included what? We've not included fuel. We've not included repairs. We've not included fertilizer. Um, we've not included labor, land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, we're extreme, we're going to be extremely unprofitable no matter what we do here with the rest of our costs on that hay operation. In fact, in this situation, we're, we're, we probably will be in, in such negative territory that there's no way we're going to have a profitable cattle operation. We combine it all together. 
Um, so why are the fixed costs so high in this situation? The main answer is the farm is overcapitalized. Um, we have too much equipment. You can look at that one of two different ways. One is we have too much machinery for the size farm that we have, or we have the right machinery, but we're just not using it enough. So in other words, maybe to, to get our costs down, we're going to have to do additional um, hay production for you know, other people as custom work or produce more hay and sell it, assuming we, we can get the full value of that hay when we sell it. Now to help us better understand the dynamics of, of why those costs change so quickly as we go down or up in production, if we go up in production, they go, the costs go down rather than up that we saw. But to help us understand this, that let's look at this table very quickly. So what I'm highlighting there, that's how much tons of hay we produce on average year. The next column would be that base depreciation. In other words, it doesn't matter if we use equipment or not, every year it's going to depreciate the same amount. That's why that's constant. Next column is that use depreciation. In other words, the more hay that we make on average every year, the, the quicker that equipment depreciates. And then of course, interest doesn't matter if we use equipment or not, we're still going to have that same interest charge at any production level. So if we look at the, the two fixed components, so the fixed depreciation, fixed interest, and we compare that against the variable depreciation, which is highlighted in, in gray on, on the screen. And if we look at say low production levels, we can see what? That almost all of those fixed costs are truly fixed and very little is that variable component. So in other words, we're just not using equipment enough and that's the problem there. We need to use that equipment more to, to be profitable. And if we can, if we compare say 100 tons of hay production to 500 tons of hay production, yeah, our, our overall costs go up by what? About $1,200, but we're producing five times the amount with that second level. So when we divide by, uh, number that's five times bigger and we're only increasing product or increasing our cost by about 33 percent that cost per ton goes drop goes down dramatically as you can see there from 27 to eight dollars per ton so that's what's driving those dynamics now this is what i wanted to get you here so i'm gonna throw out a number and, and obviously if, if it's 16 or 14 it's not gonna be a huge difference but i've got to make a cutoff somewhere so i'm going to say you need to get your cost probably to 15 dollars per ton or hopefully even less if you're going to have a chance of, of having a profitable hay operation at least cow quality type hay uh, if you're producing square bales for say the horse market that's entirely different uh, dynamics but for cow type hay yeah, $15 a ton is, is what you need to get. Again, somewhere really close to that. Maybe 16 might be fine, but I've got to draw a line somewhere in that sand. Uh, so how many cows do we need to reach at that level? Or I guess the first question is what production level do we need to reach $15 a ton? So let's start with that. And it looks like right around 200 tons of, of hay per year. So about 405 by five bales. Um, Roughly, how many how many cows would we have to, to utilize that hay? And, and we'll talk more about this on the third night in terms of what what is the most profitable level, level of, of hay feeding. But let's say that you need to get it down to, to two tons or less. And let's just use two tons of hay per cow just because we can do quick math here if we do that. So if, if we're feeding two tons of hay um, in this situation, that means we'd need about 100 cows. So in other words, you'd have to have a really big operation, at least here in, in Kentucky, uh, I've characterized that as a really big operation to justify having that type of equipment if one of your primary goals is, is being profitable. Um, what if we, we drop that hay capital down to $40,000? So just very quickly, let's, let's look at what we have here. So we got rid of our third tractor, our first and second one are, are lower in value. So probably nothing is new here. But to me, this still looks like pretty nice equipment. I think I, think I can make quite a bit of hay every year uh, with this type of equipment. And that's where we get our 40,000. So basically that, that diagram, that curve gets kind of squashed down a little bit. And so let's just jump to what, what production level do we need to get to that $15 per ton level? So in this case, it's, it's what about, looks like about 120 tons. Uh, so again, if we divide that by two, we need about 60 cows essentially to, to get to that level. Um, and you could, make the argument, well, if, if I develop my own heifers, maybe that's really 50 cows. Yeah, so maybe somewhere between 50, 60 cows is what you'd need uh, if you're feeding that reasonable amount of hay to get down to that, to that cost level. So somewhere in, in that area. What if we're, we drop down to 100 tons of production, you see that cost starts going up and, and we're quickly getting out of that, that 
area or that region that that we have a chance of being profitable. If if all we're making is 50 tons of hay with that equipment, we're we're again we're not as bad as we were at sixty thousand dollars initial capital, but we're still way out of bounds. We're we're never going to be profitable at that level. What about the third example, $20,000 in hay capital? And, and yeah, I'm sure no one's gonna be happy with, with this, having this equipment, but I guess what you need to ask yourself is if you're only making a, a fairly small level of hay, you know, is this good enough to get the job done? And I would argue if, you know, let's say 50 tons or 100 tons of hay production, yeah, I think you could probably do it. Um, but anyways, look, let's look at the dynamics. Again, everything kind of gets squashed down a little bit. So let's just jump to what, how many cows do we need to reach that $15 per ton level? So in this case, it looks like it, it's about 60. And again, if, if we're developing our heifers um, into cows, maybe somewhere between 25 and 30 cows, which is about what? About the state average in, in terms of my understanding. So point I'm trying to make here is that if, if, you, if, if you're kind of at that state average size herd, somewhere between 25 and 30 cows, uh, you can't really afford to have a whole lot better equipment than what we showed. Again, if, if your main or one of your main objectives is to make a profit on that operation. Now that said, if you use say the tractors for other enterprise, let's say you do a little bit of grain or you do some tobacco, you're gonna prorate those tractors by more additional enterprise. It is gonna bring the cost down. So in other words, you could potentially justify at least on the tractor side, uh, better equipment if you're spreading them over additional enterprise. But if all you're doing is essentially the cow-calf operation with the hay, yeah, this would, this would hold. Um, by the way, how many, hay, <clears throat> how many hay acres would that be roughly? So 60 tons. Um, so if you're getting three tons per acre, that's what? That, that's, um, that's just 20 acres of hay, two cuttings. So I'm pretty sure with that type of equipment, if you chose wisely in terms of purchases, you could, you could do 20 acres a year uh, with that equipment fairly reasonably. Main point we're trying to get to here is, is that, and this would be true for any type of farming enterprise, that the equipment essentially needs to be sized appropriately. When I say size, I mean cost-wise cost uh, appropriate for that farm. Now we looked at this slide already. This is a $60,000 um, hay capital getting that, that $15 per ton threshold. My next question is, or comment is we can, we can do better than that, right? We can actually get our fixed costs well below $15 a ton. And so I've got the question here, how low can we go? So what if we made 350 tons of, of hay in this situation? We've got our fixed costs down to $10 uh, per ton, which by the way, I think is one of the examples Jonathan's gonna use here in his presentation coming up next. How many acres would that be roughly? Again, at three tons per acre, about 125 acres. Uh, could we cover that much ground with that really nice equipment we saw in, in scenario one? I'm pretty sure we could. In fact, I'm pretty sure we could double that if, if if we were on the farm full time, probably not if you're doing it part time, uh, but I think we could cover that type of production that we're looking at uh, with that type of equipment. Now that brings me to what I call the skeptical farmer. And by the way, I hope all of you are skeptical. Um, I personally generally pretty skeptical when I hear something new or something that I haven't thought about before. Uh, so I do, I think we all want you to be skeptical. To me, that's to be a successful farmer, that's probably one of the prerequisites. You need to be skeptical, at least to some degree. Doesn't mean you can't be flexible, but initially you want to be skeptical. So the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is the, the first few times, and I've been doing kind of this general same presentation for probably about 10 years. Hopefully it's improved over time. But the, the first few times, I, the fir first few years I did this, I didn't have the skeptical farmer and up to that point, not every time I presented, and, and no one ever asked a question during the presentation, but usually afterwards it was over, maybe every second or third time, someone would come up to me and say something like the following. I grew up on a, on a farm, you know, in the 1970s, you know, my father purchased brand new tractor XXX or something, and, and, he, and they'll say something like, you know, I still have that tractor on the farm today, and if I sold it today, I think I, I, think I could get about as much for it now as, as what we bought it for in, in the 1970s. And I thought about it, and I knew technically they were correct in, in terms of, yeah, probably didn't, you know, probably you could get about the same today as, as what you paid for it or what your father paid for it in the 70s. But I also knew that they weren't accounting for inflation. In other words, a dollar in 1970 was worth a whole lot more than it is today. 
I just didn't realize how much. So what I did is I actually took a, a tractor that I knew very well, John Deere 3020. We, the farm that I'm from, we had a 3010. Uh, we, we no longer have it, but I've got a cousin about three miles down the road has a John Deere 3020. Um, and, and so I chose that just because I, I, I knew the, those very well. And, and I, by the way, I love the John Deere 3020. I think it's one of the best tractors ever made. Um, so what I did is I figured out what it cost if you bought that new in 1972, and it was about $10,000. And then if you bought that today, um, in other words, used, what could you get for it? And so the answer is, um, let's assume it's in good shape in terms of, you know, good 10. Engine could have 10,000 hours on it as long as it's, you know, in good shape or it was overhauled a while ago. Uh, what could you get for that tractor today? The answer is probably pretty close to $10,000. Now, one caveat there, that would be for a diesel. Gas probably maybe six or seven would be my guess. So that's a diesel, 3020. So we look on the service, it looks like that tractor didn't depreciate, right? Because same thing. But again, we're not accounting for inflation here. So what I did, and every year it changes, it increased a little bit. Um, but what I did five or six years ago, whenever I started this, I, I adjusted the CPI and every year I, I update it. And I, if I had, if I guessed or what I thought it would be is maybe 20, 30,000. And I was surprised at how, how high it was. So I'll show you the figure for 2021. It's, it's $64,000. Um, in other words, did that tractor depreciate? And the answer is yes, it, it depreciated considerably the bulk of the value. Uh, now, in fairness, the, the bulk of that probably happened the first 20 years. And, and after that, it's, it's probably held its value fairly well. I would say partly because it's a John Deere 3020 and, and it's kind of a collector's item when it's in good shape like that. But anyways, uh, I think you probably understand what I'm getting at here. Tractors do depreciate, just inflation tends to mask the extent to what they do. Um, so we cut, you know, again, we focused on fixed costs of hay production, but just realize these dynamics will, will be true for everything else. So your, your, you know, your barns, your working facilities, definitely, you know, your dually three quarter or one ton pickup truck, um, ATV, all those things. So in other words, we're not gonna have time to focus on these other ones. We wanna take what typically gets out of hand the quickest, the hay side, but realize the same things, the same problems can develop in, in all these other things that depreciate. Uh, now, very quickly to summarize, I essentially focused on, th these are all those main hay production costs. I focused on that last one, depreciation interest. Jonathan, who's going to present here next, is essentially going to use what I came up with, depreciation interest, a few different examples. He's going to combine them with all these other categories, and he's going to give you kind of overall hay production costs. Again, kind of different scenarios, so you can kind of pick which one you think is most applicable for your farm. Jonathan, uh, I'm sorry, Be Becky, do we want to take questions here or turn over to Jonathan? Yep, so we've got a, a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'm gonna ask one and then I'm gonna save the rest of them to the end of the program. Um, so it is, uh, can you compare the cost of your own equipment versus a third-party harvesting crew, say 500 bales or 250 tons? Are they asking, can you compare that against doing a custom type harvest? I, I think so, yes. We're actually, I'm gonna, the very end of today, we're gonna talk about custom harvesting. So why don't we save that question? Okay. Please remind me kind of at the end yep. of the- May. We'll circle back to that at the end okay. then. So why don't we go ahead and move on and then we'll answer the rest of these questions at the end. Okay. All right, getting it pulled up here for us to take a look. Greg, you can see that okay, correct? Yeah, perfect. Excellent. So yeah, as, as Greg alluded to, Greg uh, handled the, the fixed cost or yeah, the fixed cost side of hay production. Uh, I'm gonna dig into the, the variable cost a little bit and, and more so uh, approach this issue from, uh, you know, how uh, different yields and different prices ultimately um, affect or our overall uh, profitability. So uh, just to take you back to school here uh, real quick, um, 
rethink about some of these things that we've learned, uh, not only here in this conference, but just in general. Um, fixed costs are fixed in the short run, right? And, you know, at least in the short run, the fixed costs that we have are the ones that we have to live with. And Greg alluded to this as well, you know, that depreciation interest, you know, sometimes we call that mixed with other things like overhead costs, fixed costs, just know that that's what we're talking about. And the idea here is that, you know, at least in the short run, you know, if we're thinking about just a, uh, a typical hay production season, you know, for the most part, we're kind of stuck with the equipment that we've got. I mean, uh, kind of ignoring the fact that you could buy, sell, trade, that kind of thing, but you're still going to have costs associated with doing that. Um, but on the variable cost side of things is where I want to focus in on here a little bit and, you know, point out that, you know, variable costs change uh, with production. So as, as we increase production, um, our variable costs are going to increase. Now, some of you all are sitting out there in the audience right now thinking, yeah, but there's some, some economies of scale there and, and I don't disagree. Um, but for this presentation, for this purpose, we're going to assume that those economies of scale are, are negligible. So we're going to approach this from a strictly increasing perspective. So as uh, hay output increases, so do our, our, our variable costs uh, as well. So this slide looks very similar because it's the exact same slide that Greg just showed you. Um, you know, so we've got our cost per ton on our variable cost and um, your area ranges associated with those and then the fertilizer and depreciation interest expense down there. Um, we've mentioned this, but I'd, I want to mention this again, just because I think it's that important uh, as Greg alluded, uh, when coming up with these costs, though, those on the extremes uh, were, were taken out. And so these costs per ton are do represent probably 70, 80% of, of the typical uh, hay producers. But at the same time, just be aware that, you know, your costs could fall outside of this range. Um, arguably, you don't see that as much on the first uh, three costs listed there, at least, you know, fuel repairs, maintenance and labor. Um, land can, can be a little bit wonky depending on where you're at and what you're paying, but there is going to be a lot of variance in, in fertility costs just to, uh, depending on people's management there. And then once again, on the depreciation interest side of things. Um, and so a little bit of my background that plays into this um, is before I came back to campus and started working with Kenny and Greg um, and, and others here, um, I spent 10 years with the Kentucky Farm Business Management Program where I did actually, you know, get into the weeds, into the nitty gritty with farmers on their um, record keeping, their financial records uh, and what have you. And, and from that experience, I can tell you that um, there are huge variations in, in depreciation costs between farms. And as a general rule of thumb, we have a tendency to uh, underestimate those uh, as well. So enough of that, let's, let's, we're, we're going to approach this kind of from a, a base scenario type perspective. So this is, this is the assumptions that I'm using going into this exercise. Uh, I want to talk through these real quick and then uh, we will tweak this base scenario as we look at different, um, yield and, and um, price scenarios. So if we just kind of take the, the midpoints there, those variable costs on that previous screen, uh, they sum up to about $34 a ton. Um, if we add in uh, fixed costs, we're here we're doing $15 a ton for fixed costs, so we're not quite as low as that last uh, curve that, that Greg was showing um, at, at you know, roughly $10 a ton here, I'm using $15 a ton. Um, so that gets us up to $49 a ton just for our, our variable costs and our fixed costs. Once we throw labor in there, that adds another $8 a ton. And then when we throw our land rent in there, that, that puts us up to, to $67 a ton um, just on, uh, I mean, to, to, to count for, for our cost here. And, and you can see there on the bottom, this is based on uh, us replacing two thirds of P and K. I've already told you $15 a ton fixed cost. We're assuming a $30 land rent. And for at least for our base scenario, we're using uh, three tons uh, to the acre. So um, let's talk about bell size and let's talk about that in context to rolls. Um, so it's easier for me to think in rolls. Um, I mean, I've, I've bought hay on the, on the ton, by the ton, but typically when I buy, hey, I buy it by the roll. So just 
it just works easier in my head that way. But we're going to look at it from both perspectives, both from a per ton basis, and, and we'll talk through what these returns and stuff look like on a, a per roll basis. Now, please note my bell sizes and what you see in the parentheses there are uh, the average weights associated with that. So we're, we're looking at a four by five weighing about 800 pounds, a five by five about 1150, and a five by six at about 1400 pounds. Now, for those of you sitting out there that have got the latest and greatest Hay Roller 3000 machine that bells the bell so tight that it pulls out the uh, cattle's teeth when they try to eat it, your weights may be a little bit different, right? Um, but I promise you, I've bought enough hay uh, that these uh, weights are pretty well associated with, I mean, these, yeah, these roll sizes and, and, and weights are, are pretty accurate, at least from, from my experience. With that being said, I have also seen some really tight bells. So just think through that too. If you, if you do have a really tight bell that weighs a whole lot more and you consistently produce that, then of course, yeah, you're gonna have to make some adjustments to this. But I think on average, these are, these are pretty uh, accurate. So if we're looking at $70 a ton hay, you can see that what that cost is. So for four by five, you're looking at about $28 a roll, uh, $40 a roll for a five by five, and then $49 a roll for a five by six at those associated weights. All right, let's walk, let's work through a scenario here. So this is, this is just our base scenario, right? This is just what I showed you before um, in that list as far as the cost that we're using. So we've got uh, three tons to the acre yield at $70 a ton. Simple math tells us that's $210 in revenue. Our total variable cost, uh, once again, because we're ignoring any economies of scale that may exist there, we're just multiplying that variable cost by three. There's a bit of a rounding error in here. If you take that $34 per ton that I showed you before, multiply it by three, it'd be 102 as opposed to 101. Um, but just be sure that that's uh, uh, in your mind there. It, it did, I didn't catch this until um, just a few minutes ago. So apologies for not updating the slide, but we're only off a dollar. I promise that I ain't gonna uh, mess this up here too much. Um, and then our total fixed cost uh, come out to be $100. Uh, and and um, yeah, our, our, our total fixed cost come out to be $100 an acre. So if we just work through the math there, take that 210 total hay revenue and subtract out both the variable and fixed cost, we arrive at uh, a net revenue of $9 uh, per acre. I'm showing you this again, this is a this is a repeat. So this is at $70, um, I'm sorry, no, I'm not showing you a repeat. This is the cost per bell. So uh, with these underlying costs here of $101 in variable cost, $100 in fixed cost, that's what it's costing you per bell. Um, so $26.80 for a four by five, 38 for a five by five and 46 dollars uh, for a five by six. Um, I've also done that uh, to, to look at what the net revenue is. So a dollar twenty for that four by five, a dollar seventy three for a five by five, and a two two ten for a five by six. Uh, just don't want to want to make sure we're not getting. We're still talking about that nine dollars an acre uh, net returns. Uh, I just wanted to show it to you on on a cost per bell basis, and then a net return per bell basis. Now. We we are still profitable here at, at nine dollars uh, an acre or or dollar twenty a bell for a four by five, um, but if you think about the cost that we're using uh, and and we're using that range, um, you know that's not a whole lot of wiggle room, right? I mean, if you fall off one of those categories in the more expensive direction, um, that that nine dollars an acre uh, could turn a negative uh, pretty quick uh, as well. So let's say that we're uh, going to produce more than three tons of the acre, but we're going to use that same price. So all we're doing here over the previous example is going from three tons to four tons of the acre. Um, all that's changing here is our revenue is going up to $280 an acre, but our variable costs are going up as well. Why? Because as production increases, as do variable costs. So here at this price, you know, just getting another ton to the acre. I say that like it's just, you know, easy. Um, but getting that another ton to the acre puts us up to uh, uh, $44 uh, net return per acre. And we can break this out looking at the cost per bell. So our cost per bell went down about five bucks uh, on that four by five. So we're now at 2360, uh, 3393 for that five by five and the five by six is, is 4130. 
And same thing here. You can see that instead of that dollar twenty we were looking at on net revenue per bell at four times the, I mean at three times the acre, with that cost structure and that uh, return uh, price on the hay, we're now up to four dollars and forty cents. Um, so, one thing I do want to say, um, I don't know, and I'm going to speak purely from from my neck of the woods. Um, uh, right now in, in uh, Franklin County thereabouts, I can buy four by fives for, for less than uh, 2360 a bell. Um, so just think about that too from the perspective. Don't want to spend a lot of time talking through this, but you know, think about especially those of you that may just be getting into uh, cattle and um, hay production. Um, you know, give a close thought to what that equipment's actually going to cost you and how that's going to affect the cost of the hay that you produce. And, and think about what the local market is doing in your area. Um, and, and it may be more beneficial to, to at least consider buying hay uh, as opposed to producing it. That being said, I'm also assuming that all hay is the same and we know that's a no-no. Um, we know that there are vast differences in, in hay and quality of hay. So um, that kind of gets lost here uh, when, I, when I talk through that example, as far as you know, buying hay versus doing your own. So just be aware that I, I'm aware of the fact that that hay is not consistent in quality um, between operations and, and that would be another very important uh, component that has to factor into this uh, consideration as well. Um, all right, let me carry on here with my uh, scenarios. So now instead of looking at that, so I've looked at, at the mid range, that was our base scenario, that, that's where we're at. I showed you what four tons of the acre looked like. Let's say that we're only producing two tons of the acre, uh, even at that seventy dollar uh, hay price, our returns go negative. Um, you know, our variable costs went down because production went down, um, but we're now at twenty eight dollars the acre negative on that um, scenario. So let's look at this from a sixty dollar a ton acre, sixty dollar a ton hay. Um, and we're gonna work through those same uh, examples again. So once again, because I think on bell sizes or I think about cost per bell, this is what $60 a ton hay looks like uh, on a per bell basis under those, once again, weights that we're using. So $24 a roll for a four by five, $35 a roll for a five by five, and then $42 a roll for a five by six. Under our base scenario of three tons to the acre, um, at that price were negative. Um, you know, under $70 a ton at three tons of the acre, we were positive $9. Um, but under that same scenario, and all we're doing is adjusting that down $10 a ton, we go negative uh, right out of the gate. Um, that's what the cost per bell is uh, under the um, three tons of the acre, which, which you've already seen that uh, as well. But that's what the, the net revenue looks like. So at um, sixty dollars a ton, three tons of the acre. You're losing, you know, three dollars a bell on four by fives, uh, four dollars on a five by five, and and five dollars uh, on a five by six. What if we still have that sixty dollar a ton hay price, um, but we're now doing uh, four tons of the acre? We do go positive, but you know, before I was telling you that you know that nine dollars to the acre uh, net return or net revenue per acre uh, was a little bit scary uh, because that doesn't give you a whole lot of wiggle room if you've uh, estimated your cost uh, incorrectly. Um, well, this is even more scary because you know I would argue that four dollar net return per acre um, is you know very easily falls into a a um, a easily man uh, easy calculation error whenever you're trying to figure out what your costs are uh, or you know cost going up just a little bit would take that positive four dollars an acre to, to something negative uh, or zero uh, pretty quick cost per bell there you've seen that before but with that uh, four dollars an acre that's what that net revenue per bell looks like so um, sixty dollars a ton um, at um, four tons of the acre, 40 cents per bell, 
58 cents per bell for a five by five and 70 cents a bell for a five by six. So that, to me, that just drives home the fact there that even though we are showing positive, it's a very small positive and, um, you know, right for an opportunity to go negative quick on, on that uh, if we haven't estimated our cost correctly. I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. Um, 60 tons, $60 per ton at two tons per acre uh, is super negative, um, uh, super quick there. What, what about $50 at the ton? That's $20 hay rolls. That's what I was telling you that I can buy four by fives for uh, right now in, in my neck of the woods. And quite frankly, I can get some five by fives for close to that price as well. Um, you know, so $20 a roll for the four by five, 29 for a five by five and 35 for a five by six. Um, if we go through the same exercise again, where we're using three tons of the acre, $50 a ton, you can see that that base scenario is, is very negative at negative $51 uh, per acre, or you're losing um, $7 a bell for a four by five, $10 a bell for a five by six, five and a $12 a bell for a five by six. Uh, on that. Even if we bump that yield up on that lower hay price um, to four uh, tons per acre, it's still negative. Um, so there's, there's, and of course, if I show you what two tons is, it's going to be, uh, you know, even more negative. So with that $50 per ton hay price, there is really not a, a winning um, uh, situation there, or not a, not a uh, a production level there that is going to be profitable. So I encourage you all to, to think through that uh, as far as what you're, um, what you're selling your hay for uh, versus what you can buy your hay for um, and think through what those variable costs may be as well uh, as far as how your operation fits into those ranges that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully you've got good records where you can go back and, and look at those for yourself. Um, but if you're using those ranges, just make sure that you, um, or if you think you're, you know, in the midpoint of the ranges that I've showed you, um, you know, make sure that you do actually fit in there well, or your, uh, your relatively small profits could go negative uh, pretty quick. And now I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Greg, or actually, I guess we probably should do questions. Jonathan, I, I've got a quick question, or maybe something that you could add. Just sure. so, and I jumped off right after I, I got off just to look at question stuff. But did you talk about how if your depreciation interest goes from fifteen dollars a ton to say thirty or forty-five, how that would have affect those net returns? I did not. I did not, Greg. But that's a, a very good point. Um, you know, were you? We were using fifteen dollars. Uh, um, for that, but if you were much higher on that and you went up to that upper realm of 50 and, and possibly even higher, then that's only going to make that scenario worse, right? Um, your, your net returns per acre are uh, only going to get more negative in those cases. So we do have some questions. Um, I think we're going to wait till the end, though, to, to ask them of the whole group. But as a reminder to our attendees, we are recording tonight's presentation and we will be sharing the slide decks and the recordings once um, this evening is over via email. So Greg, I'll let you wrap up with your last presentation and then we'll take all the Q&A that we have. All right. Just give me a minute to bring it up. Okay, Becky, can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. All right. Uh, the last topic we're going to talk about, it, um, and actually there's a, there's a small subtopic at the very end, but, but basically we, we talked about, um, you know, how much does it cost you to make hay, and, and particularly for situations where you're, you, you're not using a lot of hay, let's say 50 or 100 tons of hay per, per year, um, in some situations, it, it may just be a whole lot easier or a whole lot more cost effective to do something other than make your own hay. Now, just want to be clear, we're not saying people shouldn't make hay. We need a lot of farmers out there making hay. We buy our hay on the farm here in Southern Woodford County. We need people doing that. Um, and by the way, if, if someone is selling us hay, they're producing more hay than what they need, that essentially is going to reduce their fixed costs, their, their depreciation interest on a per ton basis. 
Um, so all of us can benefit to a certain degree by doing that. So first option that you might have is actually not just buying your hay, but, but you might hire someone to come over to your farm and, and put some hay up for you. So in other words, hire a custom operator. Um, we've actually done that three times here on the farm in Wood, or one of the two farms in Southern Woodford County, the one that you're looking at right there. And, um, and in the right situation, it, it can work very well. Uh, what's the typical cost of doing it? Somewhere, you know, it will depend on the size of the bales, you know, supply and demand in the local area, et cetera. But generally somewhere between 12 and $25 per roll for the complete harvest. So, you know, cutting, raking, baling, but usually that means you're responsible for getting the hay out of the field, but, but not all those are different deals that they have. Um, accounting for difference in, in size of bales, uh, usually comes up somewhere between 30 and $40 a ton for putting, having a custom operator putting it up for you. But you may have additional costs, as an example, if you're putting fertilizer down, your overall cost can be higher. That would just essentially be the, that cost from the custom operator. What is, what is the big problem though with doing this? So in theory, it sounds great. We can have someone come in, say maybe cut um, 20, 25% of our farm for hay, uh, but what is typically the big problem in doing that? And, and I've talked to a lot of people about hiring custom operators and others, people that have done it for a while and, or tried doing it. And almost invariably the number one problem that I'm, I'm told is it's just hard to get them out there when you really want them to be. In other words, you want the hay cut in late May, maybe early June. Uh, it's, it's usually mid to late June before they get out there or even sometimes later than that. So that's a big problem. Um, you know, unfortunately it's, it's, it's hard to get around because typically the people that do this kind of work are, are also putting up their own hay. So the, the first hay they're gonna get, get done is usually their farm, not all those, but usually their farm. Um, and then, you know, their neighbors, if they're doing it for them, um, customers that they've had for a long time. And so, you know, if, if you're just starting with them, you're going to be on the low end of that totem pole and you're usually going to get your hay cut last. So that's kind of typical problem and there's no easy way of working around it. Um, and this is one of those situations where if you can't beat them, you've, you've got to learn to join them. Um, and so you either have to change the situation to, to make it more favorable to you. And, and essentially we're going to look at, at two of those, two ways to essentially do that. In other words, if, if they can't get out there until mid to late June, what can you do uh, to make that hay still decent quality? So the first um, idea I'm gonna show you is, is actually something that um, I saw, I didn't really learn until later on, but I'll, I'll show you the picture here. Um, so this is back where I did my graduate work um, in Blacksburg, Virginia. So where Virginia Tech is, is situated, and that's kind of way off to the, the left. You can see some of those tall buildings, that's Virginia Tech. Um, this, is, this was the last farm that was located in the town. I, I was in the unique situation. I got to rent the farmhouse. So I didn't rent the farm, but I, I got to rent the farmhouse. It was just to the right. Um, a, a farmer named Carl rented the farm and he lived down in the valley, farm down in the valley, uh, but, but had this farm, it was 76 acres. Um, and what he did, and I didn't fully understand it at the time, it wasn't after, this was in 2005, 2006, I think one of those two years when I take this picture, um, and it took a number of years later until I fully understood what he was doing and why it worked, but I'll explain it to you now. So the, the bulk of the farm, the 76 acres, were two big kind of pastures um, th that were subdivided, but he, usually the gate was open or the two gates were open between them. So you, most of the time it was kind of continually grazed, but there was about a seven, eight, eight, pa seven to eight, eight acre pasture that I'm highlighting there for you that was off to the side um, it, that he managed differently. And what he did is he fed a lot of hay out there. I, I would guess about half the hay that he fed on this farm, he'd, he'd feed out on the eight acres. And what he did is he'd usually get the cattle off there by at least two, three, maybe four weeks before the spring green up. And then he would let that grow up. In other words, he wouldn't let the cattle on there at all once it greened up until probably late April. And then he'd let the cattle in there. Um, I don't remember the exact amount of time, but probably about a week they'd be in there. Then he'd take them back off, put them on the other pastures. And then he would keep them off that seven or eight acre pasture for the rest of the spring and early summer. And he would, when he came back and, and it wasn't usually until mid to late June, he would cut that for hay. Um, and the reason he got there at that time is I'm sure he was doing all his hay down in the valley and, and other rentals that he probably had. And this was the last place he got to. 
Uh, but what he did, uh, and let me show you kind of how, how the system works. Again, he would graze it kind of hard in, in late April or so. And, and by the way, um, Blacksburg, Virginia was, was pretty close climate wise to, to what at least the grazing season to what we have here in most of Kentucky. So it would usually green up in, in early April. You, most farmers were grazing by kind of mid April. Uh, so very similar. Um, and then again, he would cut, I've got early mid June. He would usually cut it mid to late June. I would, but I'm saying early because I think in a lot of situations, if you have a custom operator, they, if they could get there by early June, that'd be great. But the point I'm going to get to here, and this is why it works so well, and I didn't realize this until years later, is by grazing it hard about three weeks after green up, he essentially reset the forage maturity at that time. In other words, it was kind of starting growth again in, in late April rather than early April. And he was having a lot better quality forage when he harvested that in, in let's say mid June than if he had if he had not grazed that at all in late April. He it probably wasn't on a one-to-one -one basis. In other words, by grazing it three weeks after the grass started growing, he probably wasn't gaining three weeks of delayed maturity, but it was probably somewhere in between. Maybe he was gaining a week and a half of, of delayed maturity, maybe two weeks of delayed maturity. But the point was he did this purposely and that was the only pasture he did something like that. On. And I'm convinced he did that. Why? Is because he knew he wasn't gonna get back there until mid to late June. And he knew by, by grazing that hard in late April, he would have better quality at, at the time of year when he cut it than if he had let it grow up from the beginning of April. Um, and then he, of course, would, would let that grow back up after he cut it, usually a month or so, and he'd graze it again two or three times in the summer, late, late summer and fall. And then uh, this you wouldn't have to do, and we'll talk a little bit about this um, tomorrow evening, but he, he also fed all the hay that he took off that, that eight, seven, eight acres, he put it in the barn and he fed it out. And he also fed some of the other barn he brought to the farm from his other farms. And by doing that, and you know, I didn't know the details at the time. I didn't know that much about beef cattle when I was at Virginia Tech, but I'm, I'm convinced that he probably had to put very little, if any, fertilizer back on that pasture because he was essentially feeding all that hay back out there. And we'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow evening with bale grazing. And then of course, he just kept repeating it year after year after year. And his yields were always excellent. Um, just was a system that worked very well. This was the third year that, that we did the custom hanging on, on this farm in Southern Woodford County. You can get an idea of how good the quality was at that time. Again, th you know, that, that same thing was grazed in late April and then we shut it off on that left-hand side and then, and then had it put in hay. I think it was June 4th when, when this was cut. Now, another idea, and this, this would be even um, in a situation where a custom operator couldn't even get out there until say July. And usually we'd think of our cool season pastures if you let them grow up uh, from early April, even if you did what Carl did, graze it hard in, in late April, even, even if you did that by early to, to mid July, the quality still probably would, would be shot, right? So that's, that um, idea wouldn't work in, in that situation, but using annual SOD is, is a way you could work around that. In other words, if, if you're a custom operator, you know he's not going to get out there until say mid-July, this is a, a, a potential option that you have to still having really good quality hay. So let me explain what I mean here. So this is annual Lesbidiza. It's a warm season legume. Uh, it's very, by the way, it's very easy to frost seed, uh, just broadcast. You, you don't need to drill it, but I do know people that drill it. Very easy to broadcast. It works very well in two situations. First one is the most common situation that is putting it, you know, seeding it into perennial pasture, pasture that's already established or, or even hay ground that's already established. So in this case, that's, that's what we did. This was pasture, it was actually rental ground. Um, and it will do well in, in the situation where it's not your, it doesn't have optimal fertility, it doesn't have the worst fertility, but somewhere in between. In other words, it wasn't great, it wasn't, wasn't absolute terrible quality, it was somewhere in between. It will generally do fairly well in that, or very well in that situation with good management. You don't want to try it in perennial pasture that has a really thick sward or hay ground that has a really good sward. If, if it does, the annual SVs won't compete as well and you won't probably have a very good stand. This is what that, that same pasture you just saw the picture of kind of looking at it farther back, what it looked like. So this was mid-July. You can see all the grass is headed out long, but it's turned brown. And you can see that understory, how thick and lush it is. That's almost all annual lesbians in terms of what you can see. It was so thick, it, it kind of overtook the, the grass is there. It's just 
the less bees is above the grass for the most part. And we didn't cut it for hay, we were grazing it. Again, we were at this point, we were buying our hay. But if, we, if you cut that for hay, I can guarantee you the quality there would have, would have been leaps and bounds better than a, a typical perennial pasture cut at that time of year. This is the other situation where it will work very well on almost the other extreme. And this is on some of your best ground. Um, so this was actually, you can see the, the corn stalk in the middle. So this was ground that was taken out of row crop production, essentially marginal row crop ground that was put in during the grain boom. And they, they were gonna take it back out of, of row crop production put, and put it back into cattle production. This is a farm I've been working with with bale grazing initially. Um, and they decided to, to, to do something kind of as a transition. And we talked about annual lesbides and maybe working very well for them. So they tried, this was actually the, the second uh, field that they, they tried. They did another one a few years before for, for three years. Um, so this is early June. You can see there's some grass in there. That's actually oats that was drilled in with lesbides and that had been grazed once before, probably three weeks before. So that was playing out early June, the lesbides is start, starting to take off. So, in this situation, it has almost no competition. So this is, that's why it's, it's kind of the other extreme. So it has no competition, really good ground. You'll see how well the annual SBs can do here in a minute. So this is early June. This next picture is, is around July 10th. And you can see on that, that grazing stick, it's about 14, 15 inches of forage. Now that would be optimal in terms of quality. That would be better quality than alfalfa probably cut in late May at this point. Now, this next picture is about 10 days later, July, roughly July 20th. And you can see the, the forage height is now over 20 inches. And that is dense forage um, on a per, you know, ton per inch basis. It's, it's probably denser than alfalfa. Uh, so incredible uh, quality, incredible yield at this stage. And that's about when you'd want to cut it for hay, about in that stage. Now, they were doing this for grazing. They have plenty of hay other, other places, so they, they, they weren't doing it for that reason but this would be great for hay production. Um, I work, or I, I'm in Missouri a fair amount in terms of doing presentations. I've got to know a number of people there, and, and there's some people in Missouri that that is their favorite forage for hay is, is annual Lesbadiza. Uh, they even have a special type they grow out there for that purpose. Uh, one, by the way, one thing I'm told is, you know, late July, uh, in ideal, ideal conditions, you can cut it one day and it's ready to bale the next because it has a very low um, moisture content to begin with. So why Lesbadiza? Why, why maybe not something like sorghum sedan grass or sedan grass? And, and specifically for if you have a custom operator coming out, the main reason is Lesbadiza has a very wide window of forage quality. So in other words, you saw it go from it probably could have been not cut for hay, but grazed by, by mid-June in that situation with the, in the crop field. But by early July, you could have probably cut it for hay. And you could see even by, by late July, it was still incredible quality. So in other words, you, if, if your uh, custom operator is scheduled to get there July 15th, but he doesn't get there another two weeks or so, Les Diesel will still be pretty good quality. Now think about sorghum sedan. If sorghum sedan was ideal middle of July, two weeks later, it's gonna be what? It's gonna be almost all stems, right? The quality is gonna be shot. So that's probably the main reason I would suggest Les Diesel, but there's some other reasons. Uh, one is it's very easy to seed. You don't need to drill it. You can just broadcast it. Seed is typically cheap. Um, I usually do no more than 10 pounds the acre. You can usually get it for about a dollar fifty or so. So 15, maybe $20 at the most per acre. It's very cheap. And then maybe just as important, it produces its own nitrogen. You don't have to put any fertilizer down. It essentially pulls it out of the air for you. So number of reasons why annual lesbians will work very well in a situation where you're trying to have custom hay put up, but you can't get someone out there until July. Uh, of course, another option would be purchasing your hay, and Jonathan mentioned that. Uh, it's what we've been doing for quite a while now. And um, when I talk to people about purchasing hay, again, we all can't purchase our hay and we all shouldn't. A lot of people can produce hay very efficiently and, and, and make a profit, but there are a lot of people like, like me, if, if we did it at our production level, that wouldn't be able to do it, at least with equipment that I'd want to have if I was doing it. Um, so what are some of the problems to purchasing hay? The, the main ones I hear I'll share with you right now. So the first one by far is it's hard to find good hay. In other words, um, it, just the, the quality is so variable in terms of what you buy. It, it's just, you know, hard to consistently get good to get good hay. And I won't disagree. 
Um, you know, it took, it took a number of years where I would, I would go out and look at hay that was for sale and, you know, at least three out of four times, if not more, what I looked at was not something I wanted to feed. So yeah, it's hard to find good hay if, if you're just kind of randomly going out there and looking. But the key is you, you've got to, you know, it's a situation where you're going to have to spend some time, look at a few different producers that are doing it to, to find ones that work for you. So I would turn that outside and say, I can find, or I, I have a, a few different contacts that I can get consistent high quality hay now, but it was only after developing those contacts. So you will have to spend some time initially, you know, developing those contacts. And once you do, make sure you buy from them eat every year, at least something to, to keep that going um, and have at least two, maybe three options in case one of them just has a bad year, the quality is you know, terrible, or they just didn't, don't have much to sell that particular year. Second problem I hear is that it's expensive. And I will say, if, if all you're doing is comparing uh, the cash cost of making hay to what you could buy it for, and let's say that, it, you know, getting good quality hay, it's costing you $70 a ton, and, and your cash costs are, say, $35 a ton, yeah, it looks like the cost is double, right? But as Jonathan went over all those other costs that aren't necessarily, we don't, Think of it as cash costs, but when you include the depreciation, interest, the land cost, your labor, et cetera, in there, it's pretty hard to you know produce hay at least if if you're at small production levels where your fixed costs are going to be a whole lot higher than that fifteen dollars per ton level that he was using in his examples. It's really hard to produce it for less than seventy dollars a ton in those situations. Um, oh, and the other thing, so the other thing people say is, especially if you have a drought, it's going to be expensive. Absolutely. And, and so if you're buying your hay, do not wait until winter to buy your hay. So typically what I do, um, I will put down roughly half the price, depends on who I'm dealing with. Some will require a little bit more. Essentially, I will purchase the hay. I will put down, let's just say half with one particular uh, supplier. And then when they deliver it, they get the other half. Um, that way I've got the, you know, the hay that we're going to need. I don't, and if, if we get a, a drought second half of the summer, I've already got my hay. Um, again, it's for, for small production levels, for, for small farms, it's usually cheaper to buy than, than to produce when you add in those high depreciation interest costs. Third thing I hear is you, you will, if you're not careful, you're bringing weeds and, and absolutely you've got to be careful about that. Same token, I would argue long run uh, fertility of your pastures and, and hay ground combined with good management is, is gonna be the key to controlling weeds. Um, and, and if those are all in, in place, you know, weeds are not gonna be a problem. Um, but what I would also say is when you buy your hay, you essentially are bringing in fertility it, as part of the cost that hay, most people don't consider it. And, and I look at it as, as a free kind of secondary benefit. Now you've got to learn how to feed it to get, take advantage of that fertility. You, can, you can't just feed it in a dry lot and, and expect it to do anything. Um, but if you're doing something like unrolling that hay or, or doing bale grazing that we'll talk about tomorrow, uh, that is essentially you know, free fertilizer that you're getting that effectively reduce the cost of that hay that you're bringing in. So essentially, you know, yeah, there are disadvantages, but we can pretty much change all those to advantages if, if you have the right context and, and if you do some things we've talked about here. What is the next biggest hay cost? So we, we you know, focused on depreciation interest on the previous, um, present or my previous presentation. And if we look at all those other costs and per ton, um, what, which other one has the highest range and, and at the high level, what has the highest cost? Answer is it's that fertilizer cost. We will talk about that more generally tomorrow um, in one of the presentations, but for tonight, the last thing I'm going to cover is essentially looking at it one specific way to reduce your fertilizer costs, uh, whether or not you're talking about uh, hay production or potentially just on your pastures, and that's to, to learn to use legumes for your nitrogen instead of using commercial fertilizer like urea. Um, there are two main advantages of legumes. So when I say legumes, most people will think of clover. Uh, some people might, you know, with cattle might grow alfalfa. It's not that common with, with cattle, but typically clover or something like annual lesbides, those are our primary legumes. So just like I said, you're, you're getting uh, increased production without that nitrogen fertilizer. And that, that's because the, the legumes have a symbiotic relationship essentially with, with bacteria in the soil that are essentially transforming that nitrogen that is in, in the air into, into usable nitrogen or usable fertilizer for that plant. 
The other um, advantage that is really important here in the upper south where we have a, a lot of fescue is that it will increase essentially the overall quality of that forage. So would you say you have 30% of, of the stand is clover and the rest is grass? That will typically be a lot better quality versus if it was something closer to 100% grass. So particularly here in the upper south where we have a lot of fescue, it's, it's more important for that reason just because that clover essentially will, will essentially counteract a lot of the, the negative aspects or, or problems that we have with that fescue. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna compare the cost of, of getting extra forage production, extra hay production with, with nitrogen fertilizing with, with urea. And then we're gonna compare that to doing the same thing, how much getting extra forage production with legumes. And, and we're gonna to try to make it apples to apples. So look at it on a cost per ton of extra forage produced basis. So we're gonna start with uh, commercial fertilizer here. So let's say we're putting down 50 units of nitrogen um, at 40 cents a unit right now, fertilizer price have really jumped. So it, it's actually quite a bit higher than that, but I'm trying to use a realistic kind of long-term number. Hopefully it, it doesn't stay where it's at. So that'd be $20 an acre in, in nitrogen. We've got to you know, spread it. So I've got $6 per acre application charge that brings our total cost to $26. Now, if everything goes right, and, and by that, I mean, we had good soil moisture that spring, early summer. Uh, it didn't get too hot uh, quick, you know, didn't get too hot too quickly in, in May or June, uh, et cetera. If we had good conditions, we would typically expect about 60 pounds of, of forage response to every pound of, of nitrogen or every unit of nitrogen that we put down. So if we multiply the 50, that 60 pound response rate, we get 3000 pounds of, of additional forage production. If we divide that by 2,000 pounds, which is a ton, that gives us one and a half extra tons of uh, forage production compared to if we didn't put down the nitrogen. So that's our, our benefit, one and a half tons of extra forage production. And by the way, if, if it doesn't go right, that, that forage response is gonna drop, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if, if everything goes right, we would divide that $26, which would be our total cost for fertilizing with the application charge, divide that by the increase in production, the 1.5 tons, and that gives us a cost per ton of $17. So in other words, every additional ton of, of additional hay that we produce with the nitrogen is costing us $17 a ton. So keep that in mind. We'll compare that against the legumes here in a minute. And again, if, if everything doesn't go right, if it was a little bit drier that spring or if it got hot a little quicker, we won't get that same response rate and that cost per ton will easily jump to say $20 a ton or maybe even a little bit more. So probably realistically, that is probably more like $20 a ton when we factor in less than ideal years. Now we're gonna compare the clover seeding or in this example, it's just, it's clover. So if you put down five pounds of red clover at $3 a pound, uh, we usually use uh, Kemlin type red clover. It's, it's usually closer to about $2 a pound, but I've got three here. So that's $15 in red clover, one pound of ladino clover at 450 pound. We add in that same $6 application charge that brings our total cost up to about $26. But we're only gonna do that every three years. So in other words, we need to prorate that, divide by three to get it, to put it on a per year basis. And we do that, that cost is 850 per acre per year. Now what I'm doing next, and I'm, I'm giving you essentially a range here because the, the difference compared to commercial nitrogen is, is there's a whole lot more variability in terms of what production we're gonna get. Uh, a lot of that is due to your management. Um, probably most of it is due to your management. And, but part of it's also gonna be related to the fertility of, of your farm and, and also you know, part, partly just dumb luck depending on the year. Um, so as a result, we have a whole lot more variability and I'm gonna show you that. Now that said, if I ask one of our forage specialists with kind of typical average management, what increase in forage production should you get by adding legumes to your stand compared to doing nothing, just you know, mostly grass and no nitrogen, this is what they typically tell me, somewhere between three quarters up to about one and a quarter ton per acre per year. So again, it could be less, it could be more, but maybe focus in on that range. And I'm gonna give you the cost per ton on the right uh, I'm obviously not going to go through all the calculations for time's sake, 
I'm just going to kind of drop it down over there on, on the right hand side. So again, I'm going to highlight in right or in red that range that again our forage specialists tell me is, is kind of typical of average management. So somewhere between seven and eleven dollars per ton compared to that 17 to maybe $20 per ton for the, the nitrogen application. Now that said, if you ask me with good management, what additional production would, would I expect or, or and typically get, it's gonna be probably one and a half tons. And, and if, if that's the case, that cost per ton drops to $6 per ton. In that case, we're what? We're about a third the overall cost of, of what the nitrogen um, would be. Now, again, the one thing we did not include would be the, the increase in forage quality. That would just be icing on the cake. So, and that's hard to quantify, but just it's better than we're, we're showing right here in terms of the overall um, cost benefit of, of clover versus that, that nitrogen application. Um, what would, just visually to give you an idea of what that extra one and a half tons with, with good management would be, you're, you're looking at it right there. So if you can kind of consistently keep about that much clover in your stand or, or not even quite that much long run, uh, you'll get that. Now, you may not get it the first year, second year. It may take a few years for your soils to transition to a point where, where they're taking advantage long run of, of, or they're getting that nitrogen circulation back into the soil. Um, so you're not going to get it necessarily right away, and that's that's one of the problems as we'll talk about. So why are you know why don't we have more farms relying on on legumes instead of commercial nitrogen, particularly for their pastures, um, but you know for both pastures and and uh, hay ground. The the first and, and again I get you know hear different things and and. But my guess is probably the biggest one is it's just easier to, to manage commercial nitrogen than it is learning how to get a good, good legume stand. Uh, and as an example, if, if you're doing mostly continuous grazing, you're gonna typically have a harder time keeping a good legume uh, mix in your stand because cattle are gonna just selectively graze it. You know, every time they're in the area, it's gonna tend to die out. First few years um, when I had cattle, I was continuous grazing and that was the problem I found. It was just really hard to keep a good legume stand. I see that just about every year, it would pop up. By the end of the summer, it was pretty much gone. It died out. Um, the next one is just tradition. You know, if, if we've been doing, you know, if we grew up on a farm and, you know, the previous generation was putting nitrogen down rather than trying to learn to get good legumes in the stand. It, you know, we just grew up that way, right? And it's hard to make a change with anything in life. So just tradition kind of gets in the way. And the last one, and, and this is something I probably need to say just because it's something you need to account for is there's typically not always, but there, there will often be a transition period. So if, if you're, you've been putting commercial nitrogen down for the last two decades, I can pretty much tell you that your soils are not going to be in a position where, where they're going to easily grow legumes, even if you go out there, seed it, you know, do good rotational grazing, et cetera. It may take a few years for the biology of those soils to change to the point where the clover or other legumes um, will, will really thrive in that situation. So it's almost like being addicted to something. Uh, it, there's a painful process in making that change, and it may take a while, right? Just like with getting legumes. But once you get through that transition, um, you essentially will get those benefits that we were showing, essentially that a third of the cost plus increased forage quality. Um, so it's definitely a transition worth taking. Um, and, and hopefully we can figure out a way to do that with more, more farms. Um, that said, I'm going to give you just the topics that we covered because you know, I, I covered a few different topics here. So if you're like me and you kind of get focused on the last thing we talk about, I'm just throwing them up there just in case you have questions on, on some of the other ones there. So that said, that's the end of the formal presentation for this evening. And I think we have questions kind of throughout the evening. So we're all here to, to take those at this point. Becky? Um, Yes, we've got several in the question and answer box. Um, the first one comes to us uh, regarding cost of hay production. Are there any thoughts regarding how to factor in what seems to be wetter and wetter weather, which equals less days to hay? And then a follow up is, um, and what are the costs of baleage or wrapping equipment to allow for making hay in damp conditions? Um, 
So I'm not sure who wants to handle this. I, I can take a stab at it and, unless Jonathan, Kenny, you either you want to volunteer here. If not, I'll take it. Have at it, Greg. So number one, I have no experience with, with balance. I mean, with making it. I I've, have a little experience, not here in Kentucky, but the home farm where I'm from in upstate New York feeding it. And we did not have good success with that. So very limited amount. I'm, all I'm saying is I have almost no experience with it. Um, now that said, I will say this, and this is this is where if you produce a lot of hay, you so if, if you're part time, if if you're kind of typical where you've got a full time job and you're doing hay on the side, that wet weather is going to hurt you a whole lot more than than something that's that's doing it full time and and can get out and every you know has every day that is good hay conditions that they're out there able to do it. Um, so, so again, if you're a, a at small production levels, doing it part time, that if we are getting wetter and wetter weather during haymaking season, it's going to hurt you more than some of these other folks. So just keep that in mind. And, and yeah, you've got to factor that in. So at some point, it may not make sense for you to do it if that's if that's the case. Um, that said, I really can't. You know, I'm not even going to try to answer the balance question. I just have very little experience with it, and I don't want to give you an answer that that I don't really know or feel comfortable with. Um, <laughs> anyone else out there that can answer that? I've I've done some baleage uh, before, and uh, you know, don't quote me on the cost, but I think you know, I, I rent a hay wrapper for you know, three hundred bucks a day or something, and the plastic cost is. A couple bucks a bell or something like that. So, um, not you know, owning the piece of equipment is going to be different. Of course, they're not cheap. Uh, and then you know, renting it, your cost per bell is going to be depending on how many bells you shove through it. Uh, but then you also have to offset that with you know, um, have your bells and and that kind of stuff too. So uh, keep that in mind as far as moving it. It's a little harder to deal with the, uh, those kind of things. But that's really all I've got to add uh, add on to that. Okay. The next question, Kenny, I think this is probably going to be for you. Um, what is the average useful life for a cow and bull? And then as a follow-up, how many cows should a bull be able to service? Yeah, I saw those in the chat box. So I, I can tell you, first of all, that I would, you know, obviously refer you to some of our animal science colleagues for, you know, another perspective on the question. I'll tell you what I use. Let's start with the cow question. So when I talk about depreciation of breeding stock on Thursday night, I'll, I'll have this number built into it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use eight productive years, meaning that when I place a heifer in the service in year one, I expect to get eight, eight, eight calves out of her over her lifetime. So that, that's kind of a simple, quick answer to what I'm gonna use. A lot of people, when they hear that, you know, they'll respond with something like, well, I've got cows in my herd that are 14 and 15 years old, and all of us do, right? You have to also ask the question, how many of them didn't make it past their third or fourth calf? So when you try and factor those two and think about realistically, what's an expectation from, you know, the first time a heifer's placed in the service, I tell folks probably six to eight years is a good rule of thumb. Uh, back in 2019, um, the, uh, the Cow Longevity Conference in Owensboro, we dealt with this, and it was pretty amazing just how much more profitable in terms of basic return um, a cow was, whether, you know, if she lasted another two or three years. So the, 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 it's a good question, very important. Um, the other question, Becky, was about uh, bull ability to service cows, I think. And, you know, so I can tell you, first of all, what I use, you know, when, when we do our budgeting, we typically think about something like 25 cows or so per bull. I know what our geneticist has taught me over the years, Darren Bullock, he said that, you know, for a yearling bull and in his first year, you know, don't expect any more than about 20 cows in year one. But then those more mature bulls can handle 25 and probably even a little bit more than that. So we use 25, younger bulls plan on more like 20, but, but somewhere in the 25 to 30 range is probably a good rule of thumb for a mature experienced bull. Okay, um, Dr. Hallett, you briefly touched on this in your presentation, but can you discuss uh, when it would be make sense to um, evaluate when it when you need to hire a custom operator versus uh, bailing your hay yourself? I mean, we have no equation to determine when that occurs, but um, basically, I was trying to get you to think through that. So if as part of that process, if you are currently making hay, you need to, you know, number one, you need to try to estimate what is it costing you to do that. And 
just as an example, if if you're making you know a hundred tons of hay and you've got that sixty thousand dollar equipment costs on the hay operation, you know we've quickly figured out that that your depreciation interest uh, costs are just way too high. So in that kind of situation, yeah, you're going to be a whole lot better off hiring a custom operator if you can get one that what that that is reliable and that you can work with them on the the quality aspect and, and again we want to have a couple ways if they can't get out there until late june or july that you can maybe deal with that um the other option you have is to buy your hay right so step one is you need to understand what your costs are if you're making it and and then the other unfortunately hard part of that whether or not you decide to go with the custom operator or buy your hay is you're still going to have those fixed costs unless you get rid of all that equipment, right? So obviously you've got to get rid of the hay equipment and quite conceivably, you've got to get rid of some of your tractors or downgrade if you don't really need them. In other words, if the only reason you had that size or that expensive type of, of tractors was because you're making hay, you're still going to have those fixed costs unless you downgrade. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated than just kind of saying yes, no, binary type things. There's, there's a lot to consider in there. And, and um, there's more than just pure dollars and cents. There's some psychology in there because a lot of people, it's going to be hard, especially on the tractor side, to, to, to downgrade um, if they're not making that hay. Okay. The next question is a two-part question. Um, costs consistently increase over the years. Minerals, twine, vaccine, seed, etc. Your earlier data covered sales since 2008 and showed what has basically been a flat income level for cow-calf producers. How much real income have we lost over the period reviewed? And does anyone have a projection as to how this is going to impact an influx, influx of younger producers into cow-calf operations? Kenny, I think this question has you written all over it. I had a feeling you're, you're gonna pass some off to me, so no problem. Um, first of all, the question's very good. And the question I think really is referring to the, the feeder cattle futures chart that, that I showed in the very beginning. Um, now, for clarity, what we talked about with that chart was that we did move to what looked like a higher price level around that 2011-2013 time period. But when we take out the 2014-15 time period, we've been fairly flat since then. So, so the first part of the question is, I think, yeah, you can't argue that looking historically over the last 10 years, with the exception of those two years, we've seen fairly flat calf prices, and we did not show real prices, we showed nominal. Now, if you just use something like CPI, for example, as a way to estimate what inflation effects would be, you're looking at something like one and a half, two percent a year. So the first part of you, the first answer to your question is that's that's essentially the loss in real income, essentially, is that over time. The other thing that I would say though is this notion of you know flat to even sometimes declining commodity prices and input costs that don't decline is really not that uncommon in agriculture. And it does have an impact. It's also why we tend to see consolidation. So the question was about new operations, and sure, there's you know there's implications there. That's also why you know producers that are in the cattle business consistently have to look for ways to be more efficient, and why we tend to see you know some of these smaller operations exit, and we tend to see some of the operators that are left get larger over time. It's because you almost have to capture some of those efficiencies to deal with the environment where your you know your the value of what you produce tends not to increase. The next question is, do you have a slide on hay storage um, versus outside storage and shrinkage loss? I don't think any of us, I mean, that that's for ag engineering question. Um, maybe the forage specialists, unfortunately, I don't, and Kenny and Jonathan, if, if I'm wrong, chime in, but I don't think we're going to do a good job of answering that compared to some of the other specialists at the university. Yeah, we certainly don't have anything prepared. Um, there definitely has been some work done, although the last work done at UK on this was, I want to say, 15 years ago. But it did look at hay. It did look at hay storage losses using different methods like hay stored inside, hay stored outside, net wrap, things like that. What I tell producers when it comes to hay storage is, you know, make sure make sure what you do fits. In some cases, that might mean a large hay structure. 
In some cases though, there are some fairly inexpensive ways you can improve your hay storage method to minimize loss. That can be as simple as poles, gravel pad, and some tarps. So, you know, do what makes sense. If you're a small operator, you know, don't think you automatically have to build an expensive hay storage shed. There may be some inexpensive ways to get some benefit. Break contact with the ground is oftentimes the first thing you want to think about somehow, and that can be done in different ways. And then beyond that, some sort of cover can get you a lot of the benefits that you would get from truly, truly under roof storage in a much cheaper fashion. So we have several questions on um, Les Bediza that came through uh, from your comments in your presentation. So I'm going to kind of work through these. Uh, will Les Bediza compete in a field that is heavily red and white clover and fescue? And the answer there, I thought I discussed all that, but the answer is no. If, if you've got a really good stand of clover mixed in with, with grass, it, it won't do well there. Um, unless you're going to, you're willing to have extreme management with it, which I, I wouldn't suggest. You're going to essentially have to control that, that competing vegetation uh, to the point where it, you don't want to do it. So the answer is no, you, you don't want it. It won't work well in that situation. And then how many cuttings uh, can you get on annual Les Bediza? Now, also noting that we've never actually cut annual Espiza ourselves. So this is just based on what, I, what I've talked to other farmers and, and predominantly in Missouri that, that a whole lot more people still grow it there for some reason and my guess is tradition. Uh, but I've been there, they have very similar growing conditions to Kentucky. Uh, what I'm told is typically you'll get one really good cutting and then kind of one second cutting if you get to that first cutting, you know, not too late that won't be nearly as good. But typically what I'm told is if, if you can, you know, if it's in a pasture type situation or that fenced off, they usually graze the second one. So one really good hay cutting and, and then typically one grazing after that. Um, that said, my, my gut feeling is if you got the first cutting in early and you didn't cut it too short, um, I think my, get, my gut feeling is annual Espediza, it's not like alfalfa, it, it doesn't store a lot of energy in, in the root system. So if you cut it low, it's, it's going to take a long time for that annual Espediza to come back. And, and the reason I know that is because when you graze it, which we do, as long as you don't graze it low, it comes right back very quickly. So if I was trying to get two cuttings, I would cut it no more than say four inches tall. Uh, try to get it cut by mid-July, and then I, my guess is you'd get a decent second cutting probably late August. Um, and then a follow-up, let's see, what's the best time to add the Lestadiza seed to an existing hay field? Uh, a, a year ago, I would have said um, typically when you see clover, so like, you know, February, early March, um, so Kenny and I, and we seed by hand, we have a hand broadcast and we, we do it, you know, we could easily buy, um, you know, PTO type, but we think it's good exercise. So between the two, two of us, we do everything by hand, but we did about 20 acres of Lesbadiza in late February and, and up to mid-March. And if you all remember last year, we got a real bad freeze in, I forget the exact date, but maybe around April 10th or so, and plus or minus probably a week. I mean, like down in the 15s or so. And that wiped out that early seed of Lesbiza because if you remember it, we also had a really warm March that Lesbiza germinated and that may have been part of the problem. Maybe in a typical year, it would not have germinated, uh, but it did. And when we got that um, or, or late freeze, it wiped out Lesbiza and, and Kenny and I reseeded 20 acres. Um, and <laughs> let me just tell you, that was the hardest 20 acres that either of us have, have ever seeded, just the psychology of doing it a second time. So what I'm saying is uh, this year, we're being a whole lot more cautious. We're seeding later than normal. So we didn't start seeding until probably mid, well, we probably did seed some in early March, but I'm, I'm purposely not seeding a good half of the, the what we're seeding until around now, just in case that happens again. You don't have to get it seeded nearly as quick as clover, but if you're gonna seed clover with it, and sometimes we do, obviously you, you probably wanna seed it a little bit earlier for the clover, but so I'm not, I'm not giving you a great answer. I'm just saying you've gotta be somewhat cautious because if, if it does germinate early and, and it, it, it is not tolerant of really cold temperatures. So, so as, a follow, 
as a follow-up to that, why would you add clover, um, ladino clover with the red clover? Uh, well, I can give you my opinion that, um, so the reason we do it is ladino, you don't need to add a whole lot, you know, typically, whether it's with annual Espedisa or red clover, some combination, one pound of Ladino, the, the seeds are so small that we, we almost do it for insurance. In other words, to me, it's, it's a fairly cheap addition. Um, and that sometimes red clover, some years red clover just doesn't do well. Uh, I don't, you know, something probably in the biology of the soil. And so to me, it's almost like insurance. If the red clover doesn't well, doesn't do well, you've got the white and vice versa. Uh, that, that's the best answer I can give you. Okay, so how many cuttings of hay is usual on a farm and what are the usual dates of hay cutting? Jonathan, Ken, you guys wanna take this one? I'm gonna just say it, it varies and it depends. Um, you know, depending on what the forage is, depending on the management style. Um, you know, if you're doing something that I, it, I'd have to sit here and rack my brain, but if you're doing something, you know, like alfalfa, you know, not hard to get four cuttings out of it. I can't tell you exactly how many times I cut mine every year because it depends on moisture and, and, and so on and so forth. So while it is a bit of a squirrely answer, I think the best answer is it depends. Yeah, we're, we're probably not the best group to ask that question, is my guess. Yeah, there's a lot of forage related questions in the chat in the comments tonight. So I'm trying to just get them all mentioned and let you all kind of address sure. them from there. Yeah, we'll do uh, our best. Yep, you're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. So the next one is um, it's a clover related question again, but are your pounds per seed? per acre of clover calculated based upon bag weight or upon label information as true seed per pound uh, since seed are usually coated and germination rate for the seed is purchased. Yeah, and I understand the, the question. And, and whenever I say, you know, whenever I give a rate, it's, it's actual um, pounds related to the bag. So not adjusted for coating. So literally, if I say 10 pounds, it's 10 pounds on the scale or five pounds or one pound, whatever. Okay. Um, the next question is, what's the best way to find a custom operator? Um, there, and Jonathan, Kenny, please chime in. If, but I don't think there's an easy way. I don't think there's like a yellow pages for custom operators. At least I haven't found it. So. Um, some of it is just kind of networking, you, um, you know, just hearing from people, you know, this person does custom work. In other words, if you're just starting out and don't know many people, I, I don't know what to say other than you're going to just have to talk to a lot of people, find out who's doing a lot of hay. My guess is someone that, that puts up a lot of hay, if they don't do it, they'll know others that do custom work in your area is my guess. That, that may be the best advice I could have. And start with people around you too, right? If you've got folks around you that produce hay, you know, it's probably going to, they've got the lowest cost to do that for you. So start with them and, and, and build your network that way. And that's actually a good point that Kenny's bringing up because sometimes people may not, may have never done custom hay for other people, but if it's someone that's local and they produce hay, and if, if some people really enjoy putting up hay, I found, and they might be willing to do custom work for you, even though they've not done it before. So that's another reason to start with people that put up hay around you. My guess is at the right price, most just about anyone might be willing to put up custom hay for you. Um, the next question is, can you manage annual Lespedeza to be able to reseed itself? And also will graze on next kill it? So the herbicide question, I do not know. We don't use herbicides on the farm. So I, I just, I have zero experience with herbicides. Um, in terms of the lesbides are reseeding, yes, you can get lesbi annual lesbides to reseed itself, but you, it's, it's kind of hit and miss. So some years um, it will work wonderfully. It will set seed and the next year it will reseed beautifully, but it's somewhat, at best, I would say it's somewhat of a gamble. So lesbian seed is, is usually cheap enough where 
even if I think that we have pretty good seeds. So as an example, and one of the areas that we see the last year it had really good seed in, in the fall, um, but it's just so valuable in that area that we have annual SBs that we're seeding again this year just to make sure. Um, but generally if, if you uh, kind of let it grow up late summer, early fall without grazing it hard, it will typically reseed itself pretty good, at least Korean lesbies. Uh, we don't have a lot of experience with cobe lesbies, and my understanding is cobe sets seed later in the fall, so it, it's a little harder to, to reseed itself than Korean variety. The next question you might say that you want to refer to your colleagues, but I'll see if you have any solutions too. Are there any good ideas for disposal of plastic bale wrap other than filling a landfill burn or bury? Any what? option for recycling that you know of? I don't think we heard sinkhole, did we? No, that one wasn't mentioned. <laughs> um, of course. <laughs> So seriously, my one experience, and again, this is back in on the farm in New York, and I've got a partner that manages the farm, but we he tried it, and that was the I mean, that was part of the problem is there was just plastic everywhere. It was even he tried to clean up. I just hate it because of the plastic problem. So what, what this person is saying, um, yeah, it's in theory, um, there's a lot about balance that sounds good, but there's some things in practicality with the rat being one of them that that are kind of problems. So I don't have a good answer <laughs> for that. So this is the last question that's in the Q&A box. So if there's any follow-up questions, you still got to, we'll take a couple more before we wrap up the evening. But how do you factor hay quality, TDN, energy, et cetera, into cost per ton or roll of hay if purchasing hay? Jonathan, you want to? You got an answer here? So the, the question is, how do you factor in the hay quality into the cost per ton? Okay, so um, I mean, I'll just be real blunt with everyone. I don't think most people actually do a very good job of selling their hay uh, and, and they don't actually take that into consideration. So um, yeah, before you buy hay, you should look at it, inspect it, you know, know what you're buying. Um, but yeah, there is, there should be now that doesn't mean that it happens, but the, the higher the quality of the hay, the more the hay is worth and therefore, therefore it should demand a higher price. Um, but my gut, well, not just gut feeling experience suggests that some people sell really good hay for cheap and some people sell really, really bad hay for way too much because it, it shouldn't be sold at all. Uh, it should be turned into mulch or something like that. So, um, yeah, that's that's my two cents on that on that question. I'll concur with Jonathan, particularly from the standpoint that hay is not priced like it should be relative to, to quality. And, and I'll say this, there, there's a lot of five by five bales out there that junk hay that twenty five dollars is way too much for. Um, and there's a and there's a lot that I would pay fifty dollars a bale for that that is really good quality. So in other words, um, usually really good hay, at least cow quality hay, this maybe isn't true with horse type, but with cow quality type hay, really good hay is, is usually a really good buy and poor quality hay is, is usually you're paying too much for it because you're just not getting the nutrients. I think that's what Jonathan is saying. Hopefully yep. I'm not that, that is, that's what I'm saying. So we have had a couple of attendees send us a panelist a, a chat that said to find custom hay producers, you may want to contact your local county extension office, that there are a lot of offices that maintain a list of those in your county. Do you all have any wrap, wrapping up comments for the evening before we close out? There was one comment in the chat that was kind of a comment slash question to Becky, I'll, I'll mention real quick, and I don't remember who made the comment, but the comment was basically that phosphorus is a challenge because uh, it's hard to get triple super. It's almost impossible. When you do find triple super, it costs the same as DAP anyway. So most of us that are applying phosphorus using commercial fertilizer are getting some nitrogen with it. So I think that comment was probably related to some of the discussion about trying to establish maybe some legumes in existing pastures. So that was a comment slash question, but a very good thought. If you're Using commercial fertilizer, that's oftentimes a challenge. So you want to think about cycling that so that you're not necessarily getting too much in down so that your grasses overcompete the, 
the clover, what are we trying to establish? Kenny, I think you have a, a CAPE code for the group. If you need CAPE certification for tonight, this will this will be our CAPE or your CAPE code for tonight that you'll use with your county agent. So you'll get your CAPE forms obviously, obviously from your extension office. In the line where it typically says speaker signature, put in this code CCPC. That's Cal CAP Profitability Conference, and I'm really creative. The TUE is simply Tuesday, so. That should be sufficient. If you have any questions, obviously reach out to your agent or, or let me know. So just to close out the evening, as some reminders, we put the registration link um, for tomorrow night session, Wednesday night and Thursday night session, along with the agenda. So you can follow those links to register for those sessions if you have not already. Um, and we all will also be sending out a link with the uh, recordings for tonight, along with the slides. So you'll have that coming soon in your email. Um, but we really do appreciate everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we appreciate the funding that we received from the Ag Development Fund to participate in this or, or host this conference for you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow evening. Thank you all.